1203. And welcome, everybody. Uh, very exciting to see such a such a uh, refresh of our of our board and all these new faces. Um, so many of you, some of you have been on OOST meetings before and kind of know how this rolls. But for those of you who this is a first meeting, um, we're just going to go down through the agenda. Um, and yeah, we've got some great stuff on the agenda today. I think we should start by taking a maybe a little more than a quick moment to introduce ourselves as we have three new board members to welcome to the OOST. Um, so it would be nice to just hear just a little brief bit about your background or your experience or your interest or what brought you to want to apply to be part of this organization. Um, and I'll probably just, uh, I'll call names. That makes it a little easier than wondering that awkward pause. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. I'm Laura Anderson. I am the chair of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. I usually reside in Newport, but I'm spending more time in Joshua Tree this year, where I'm actually at right now. And I'll be back in Newport again um, in about a month. I um, am a founding uh, member of the OOST and uh, so have been with uh, the organization for all of its, I think, nine years or something now. And I've been the chair for maybe the last four years, um, kind of made that number up. I think that's close. <laughs> So yeah, I, am, I come from mostly a seafood industry background, but I do have a science background with uh, my marine resource management degree at OSU, which many of you know is very rigorous in science. And so that helps me keep up with all of the wonderful scientists that come to give presentations to us and help us to do our work. So um, yeah, looking forward to that. And I think with that, I'll just kind of go down through the other board members and then we'll end introduce others on the call. So Dr. Keith Wolf, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you, Laura. And uh, hello, everyone. Nice to be here. It's nice to meet all of you. Uh, I know some of you from um, peers and we're peers and colleagues and others from the recent summit where every, we got together and did some really great work uh, on behalf of, of the trust. And um, you know, my background is pretty varied, but it's, you know, it centers around natural resources management. I've worked for the state of Washington for tribes and for, I, I currently work for NOAA, and I also have had my own consulting firm. Uh, I'm about 35 years into this adventure, and, uh, you know, my work here at NOAA centers around Endangered Species Act and climate change. I serve on the West Coast Climate Team, and uh, we now have a form, uh, forming up a working group for marine carbon removal. It's a nationwide program through uh, nine different federal agencies. NOAA is the lead for that. And then, uh, so I know we'll have a little discussion about oh, the uh, Oregon uh, Council to later today. Uh, but I'm, I'm a Northwest native. I'm from originally from Yakima, Washington. I grew up farming in Yakima, Washington. Uh, worked for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife there for a number of years as a fish program manager. Uh, worked in Olympia for a number of years, lived in Seattle. And then uh, during the times I uh, worked for the tribes, I was a policy advisor and science program manager for them. And I had worked in Portland, you know, at the Bonneville Power Administration, which is right behind me, and uh, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council process. So the Federal Columbia River hydropower system and the Northwest Power Act really drove a lot of my work with the tribes for about 14 years. And so I traveled here. I, in fact, I took the train every month, uh, twice a month, down here to Portland. Uh, I did my PhD on that train on Amtrak. So yay, Amtrak! Thank you very much for the uh, for the upgrade to business class. And uh, I love Portland so much, you know, being here so much that uh, I made the move about three and a half years ago, and I and I really enjoy it. Oregon's always been near and dear. Um, the Oregon coastline is more accessible. Than the Washington coastline, so more happens here, and uh, uh, I'm just proud, honored, and pleased to really be a part of this uh, this board and the mission that we all serve, and and you have all served as well. 
Wow, fantastic. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kristen, Dawn. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kristen Dawn. Um, I am new board member to OOST. Um, I have been in Oregon for 20 years now. Um, I live also in Newport, Oregon. Um, I, my background, um, I grew up in California, but my dad's side of the family all lived in Oregon. And so growing up, we would come visit our family um, in Oregon. Um, they lived in Gresham, but my grandparents had a vacation trailer up in Lincoln Beach. Um, so uh, just a little north in Newport. So if we were ever visiting them in the summer, we would always come to the central Oregon coast. And I've always, always loved the ocean, um, loved going to the Oregon State University Hatfield Marine Science Center Visitor Center when I was a kid, um, because there were real scientists <laughs> there. And I just thought that was the coolest, most inspiring thing. So when time came time to go to college, I wanted to study marine biology. Um, my life also revolves around the water. I was a competitive swimmer and a competitive water polo player. So um, loved to body surf um, and surf. Uh, so my, my world is water. Um, so studied marine biology at UC Santa Cruz, um, then went to graduate school up in Seattle at the University of Washington, did a similar program to what Laura did um, at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs. So like this interdisciplinary ocean policy management program. So even though my background was more marine ecology, um, I got exposed to a lot of other um, social sciences, also like dispute resolution, um, community engagement. Um, really what I realized, I, was, I wasn't a researcher. I really enjoyed science to help get information to help solve problems in the real world. That's really um, what originally I realized attracted me to science in the first place. I just wanted information to help try to solve problems. Um, so after graduate school, I landed my dream job on the Central Oregon Coast in, in Newport with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I worked for 18 years at ODFW, um, worked on a variety of projects. I did near shore fisheries management. I worked on wave energy policy, but most notably, I was involved with the planning and implementation of Oregon's marine reserves. Um, so that's five marine reserve sites off the Oregon coast. And I was the first program leader for that program. Um, I ran that program for 12 years and left about a year and a half ago. Um, just needed to do something new and different. It was time to move on. So um, I've been mostly doing some consulting work on the side right now and uh, just keeping my toes in the water with resource management in Oregon and the West Coast. So excited. And I was, you know, even involved when we were thinking about OOS back in the day. Um, so it's really exciting to see how far it's come. So that's me. Mm. Great. Yeah. Share that. I, I always want, I always fantasized about the Hatfield Marine Science Center. It was just like, it was like the thing that, um, I think it still is for so many people and so many young people and even more so now. Uh, Ted DeWitt, can you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, really a pleasure to, to be working with you all and meeting uh, several of you. Um, my uh, background is that I grew up in California and then uh, sort of hit the uh, the East Coast for a while for college in Florida and New York, and then after grad school, uh, in a in a in an ecology and evolution program, I uh, came out to work with the Environmental Protection Agency at uh, based at Hatfield, and uh, I like Kristen was saying, I kind of uh, felt a need to switch from uh, sort of a natural history based work to something with a clear uh, connection to uh, problem solving and you know societal issues. So I came out and was working more in the pollution realm and uh, ecotoxicology for uh, quite a while and then wanted to get back to my ecology roots at about the same time that some of the mission of uh, EPA opened up to include looking at 
multiple stressors and uh, uh, impacts on habitat and uh, consequences at uh, ecosystem level, which uh, appealed to me. And so I uh, was fortunate to uh, stay on working uh, and and to become part of the the federal uh, lab there as uh, as a researcher. And about uh, mm, I should know the date, but around 2015, I took over as the the supervisor of the, of the lab and uh, uh, saw the the branch through uh, several interesting changes and 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 uh, various uh, turmoil out of DC. Um, and then about a uh, about a year and a half ago, I retired. And so now I am uh, footloose and uh, fancy free. And I still have a, a, a toe in on some of the research I was doing there as some of my colleagues finish up work. And um, a lot of that work towards the end of my research career was focused on ecosystem services and trying to make links between ecological features in the landscape and what people care about when they interact with nature uh, and so when I, you know, learned about the opportunity to join the OOST and 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 uh, was looking into the mission, I, uh, you know, the, it really resonated with me that the the focus here is to try to identify and and foster science that um, links well to Oregon communities and uh, to the the general well being and welfare of uh, of Oregon. So. That's sort of my nutshell. Wow, oh, this is wonderful. Thank you so much and welcome to these three new board members. And I uh, also want to welcome Dr. Karina Nielsen. You're the last of the voting board members to introduce yourself. And we were just doing a little bit more than our usual in the interest of getting to know each other a little bit better. So. Um, but I also know that you're home with a cold, so you might not feel too much like storytelling right now. We'll let you be the judge of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I start having a coughing fit, I'll turn my mic off and go off camera, but um, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, or I guess it's lunchtime now. Um, it's great to be able to continue to be a member of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. Um, I'm uh, currently serving as director of the Oregon Sea Grant Program. Um, I have a background as a coastal marine ecologist. Um, I actually did most of you know, all of my PhD graduate field work on the Oregon coast, um, know the systems quite well from an ecological perspective, um, went on to be a, a professor in the California State University system for almost 20 years, managed a marine lab on San Francisco Bay and was very involved in uh, the policy science nexus for the state of California in particular around marine reserves planning, uh, public engagement around that, science advisory team roles, and um, also still maintain a relationship with the California Ocean Science Trust, which is a, a parallel organization. As you all know, probably, you know, we had at our last science summit meeting, some orientation to that, both California and Oregon are the two states that have such organizations uh, in the nation. So uh, some interesting opportunities there. I think I'll leave it at that. I think that gives a pretty good introduction um, and uh, looking forward to working with everyone this year. And I made it through without coughing or sneezing, yay. <laughs> Lauren, you're on yeah. mute. It's going to be one of those days. Uh, we have two non-voting members for the trust. Uh, Representative David Gomberg, would you please uh, say a quick hello to us? <laughs> a quick hello. Laura, it's uh, it's good to be here with all of you, and it's particularly exciting to, uh, to meet three um, wonderfully qualified, enthused, and... Uh, and valuable new members to the to the trust. I am uh, State Representative David Gomberg. I have been a legislative delegate to the trust since its inception, a non-voting member uh, for these uh, number of years. I represent House District 10 on the Central Coast, which now stretches from Lincoln City to Junction City 
and from Philomath to Florence, uh, takes in uh, all of Lincoln County and the western portions of Lane and Benton counties. Um, um, we used to call it a coastal district, but it's a little hard to uh, to describe it that way anymore, since with uh, the recent redistricting, I stretched to within about five miles of I-5. But I, I still think of myself as a as a coastie, and I am the uh, current co-chair, excuse me, the current chair of the Coastal Caucus, which is made up of those legislators, uh, Senate and House, that uh, that represent coastal districts. Came to Oregon um, to attend Oregon State University, got my bachelor's degree in political science, got a master's there in political science, economics, and history, and then shifted over to Willamette where I earned an MBA. And what did I do with all of those uh, degrees? Um, my wife and I started a kite company. We manufacture, wholesale, designed, and performed with kites. Uh, at uh, one point had three stores and four web pages, but did performances with our really large kites um, um, at events around the world. Uh, we performed for the Super Bowl. We did the London Millennium Celebration. We did backdrops and several motion pictures and went to about 40 different countries. We uh, retired our business in, um, in 2019, made the decision that we would close up and retire at the end of 2020, um, having no thought at all to what 2020 was going to look like. But we have closed down our, uh, our business at that point. My wife has happily retired. And uh, for me, it just simply freed up more time to commit to the part of my life that pays the least. So I am now in my uh, my 12th year in the Oregon legislature. Because there's so much turnover, very interesting, that makes me fourth in seniority in the House. And I'm currently the vice chair of the uh, the Budget Writing Ways and Means Committee. And uh, we're getting ready to go back into uh, to legislative session in just a few weeks where I'm going to be working to expand the um, the base that we have created for our marine reserves. And uh, that's going to be an important piece of work. By the way, with our... Uh, redistricting three of those five reserves are now off the coast of my district. So I'm very proud of that. The final thing I'll leave you with is uh, Chris and I played water polo in college too. So we'll compare notes sometime. <laughs> 12 years representative. Wow. I, um, yeah, I, I can't, can't say that surprised me for a moment there. It seems like it was just yesterday when you were uh, coming coming into the legislature. Well, well thank see, you it for... seems like just yesterday for you and it seems much, much longer to me. Right. Well, thank you for your leadership on ocean issues and your uh, participation for the OOST. Um, we have a few uh, really key staff folks on the call, including uh, Linda Safina Massey, who's the executive assistant that makes sure that our meetings are on time recorded, that you get all of your information that you need. And I caught a brief glimpse of Chris Costelli's face. Nice to see you again, Chris. It's been a long time. Chris was actually um, really key when we first started the Oost. He was um, really with us through all of those early meetings and, and rules, but he went through some, um, some promotions in the department and is now the government government relations manager for the department. And it's great to have you back working with us again so closely, Chris. I know you've kept an eye on us over these years. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm excited to, to be involved with the Oost again. So I appreciate that. And of course, Lisa DeBrookier is um, our contract. Um, I don't know exactly what the term is. I think of her as an operations manager. She just like manages um, all of the inner workings of our contracts, RFPs and um, recruitment and uh, so much more than that. Thank you, Lisa. You are more than welcome. Happy to be here and it's great to see all of you. And I'm going to wait on uh, Dr. Rum, uh, Rumro and also uh, Dr. Menge because they're presenting to us, but just maybe a quick name and uh, affiliation if you are with an affiliation from, uh, let's see, Nadia, then Michelle, and then Jan, please. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Nadia Gardner, and I'm a consultant supporting the Oregon Ocean Conservation Fund, which is a donor-advised fund at the Oregon Community Foundation. I love sitting in these meetings just to be around the best and the brightest and hearing what's going on. Thanks. Always good to see you, Nadia. Michelle? And perhaps we'll jump to Jan. Hi, I'm Jan Halder. I'm retired from the uh, University of Oregon's Institute of Marine Biology. And um, I just have to let you know that the Zoom link that you sent earlier this, earlier in December, is not the right one. So um, it took me a while to be able to find it. So there might be other people out there searching for what the Zoom link is. Well, we'll keep a, I'll keep an eye on my um, email just in case anybody's trying to reach out if they're having issues. Thank you for that. Um, Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Lisper. I'm with the Chief Financial Office, and I am the CFO analyst for Department of State Lands, where Oost right now currently resides. Oh, so I'm welcome. On all right, I think I went all the way around. If I missed anybody, point it out to me. Um, don't think so. Otherwise, um, without further ado, I'd like to get an approval of the previous meeting summary. Um, a link was uh, put in the chat. I think Karina and I were the only persons uh, who could uh, probably make and second a motion on that. So. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns, amendments to the min uh, meeting summary? None for me. Would you like to make a motion? Yeah, I, yeah, I'll go ahead and move that we approve the meeting summary from the last meeting. Okay, and I'll second the motion as the other one who was in attendance. And then if the board members could uh, uh, either approve, all approved, yay. 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 And any not approved? No, no abstentions. So good to go there. Thank you, Linda, for your um, service and keeping our meeting summaries really nice and tight. Um, looks like we are right uh, to move into our presentation. So for the new board members, we often like to get at least two um, very short presentations uh, from PIs on ongoing oost funded projects throughout our um, annual meeting series. So for today, we have uh, two such presentations queued up, the first of which will be from Steve Rumrall at ODF&W. Steve is going to be giving us an update on his project that he leads on kelp communities in transition, a spatial mosaic among changing population of bull kelp, sea urchin, abalone, and sea stars within rocky reef habitats on the southern Oregon coast. I'm excited. I love this topic. Uh, great. Um, Steve, do you have everything that you need to get going? I think so. So I, I think I'm ready. I'm going to drive the show from my computer here in Wellport, uh, but I need to share screen first. So let's try that. Can you see my screen? Yes. See if it'll come up here full screen. There we go. Okay. So uh, let me just take a, a minute then to introduce myself. I'm uh, Steve Rumrell and I work with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm part of the Marine Resources Program and I have specific duties as the shellfish program leader. I've been in that capacity here on the Oregon coast for the past 13 years. And I had the pleasure to serve for 21 years before that as the chief scientist for the South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve a very nice partnership between the Oregon Division of State Lands or Department of State Lands and NOAA. Uh, I wanna reach back though much further. Uh, I've known Bruce Mengi. Bruce, I look back through my records 
Uh, we've known each other for 46 years. And uh, I became aware of Bruce as a talented ecologist, a uh, world star, way back when I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz as, a, as a, one of those alumni. And Bruce was on the seminar circuit talking about uh, the, uh, the differences in reproductive biology between big pisaster and tiny leptosterius. And I was very intrigued by that and we struck up some interesting conversations. I'm happy to share the, uh, the agenda with Bruce here today. So uh, I'm gonna speak as, as Laura did, uh, described about kelp communities in transition. So let's see if the technology is gonna work here. Yes, so this project uh, is supported by the House Bill 5202, and one of the uh, projects that's supported by that RFP, and I'm the chief scientist on this, or the PI. Uh, my co-PI is Scott Growth, uh, who has served for many, many years as the shellfish biologist down in the South Coast, and he's really our expert in abalone and urchins, uh, sea stars. Scott has recently been promoted to the leader for the resource assessment and management section. So he's now my boss, uh, which is great. And is part of the, the uh, changing transitions that we're all seeing. So um, we're also partnered up in this project with the commercial sea urchin harvesters. We have the only viable commercial sea urchin fishery on the coast. We work closely with them. And then also with science divers from the University of Oregon, Oregon Coast Aquarium, the U.S. Forest Service, which also has a science dive team, uh, the new Oregon Reef Check uh, folks, and also our conservation partners, the Oregon Kelp Alliance and the Alaka Alliance. So the context here is that uh, over the past decade or so, we've really been watching and observed recent changes to our rocky reef and kelp habitats along the South Coast from roughly 2013, beginning with that very massive uh, marine heat wave that was known uh, region-wide as the blob, the persistent El Nino conditions that have gone on uh, since then and subsequent uh, marine heat waves, all of these contributing, we believe, to changes in our rocky reef habitats. We know what we're seeing, but we don't necessarily know the mechanisms. But coupled with the marine heat wave, uh, we also observed the massive death and, uh, and loss of sea stars, many sea stars, most notably the Pisaster ocracius that uh, Bruce Mengi and his team are so famous for documenting their ecological interactions. But that massive loss of sea stars affected, we think, 20, 25 species of sea stars and is still ongoing today. Uh, we've certainly seen recovery of some species, but not all. Coupled with that uh, is, has been declines in our kelp and seaweed. We think somehow the marine heat wave interrupted with either nutrient cycling or uh, production of spores or perhaps the settlement and survivorship and growth of the little sporlings uh, somehow inter interfered with their normal propagation. And we've seen some pretty significant declines in kelp and seaweeds uh, region-wide, Northern California throughout Oregon as well. Also uh, during that time frame, 2013 to 2014, we saw massive increases in recruitment of sea urchins, primarily purple sea urchins. And coupled with that, we think that that was uh, somehow related to the release from predation by one particular sea star, sunflower sea stars, uh, but could have been other, other factors as well. And the increase in the abundance of urchins through their grazing activities uh, has helped further exacerbate the decline in seaweeds and, and kelp and is now also uh, contributed very importantly to the decline in red abalone, in particular by taking away or reducing the amount of, of drift algae. So that's the context that, that uh, we put our proposal together in. Now, kelp beds, we recognize, provide ecologically important benefits and habitat in the rocky reef areas uh, through lots of different mechanisms. They're um, important primary producers, also important nutrient cycling and carbon storage. Uh, kelp beds provide complex heterogeneous structure in the water column. They're hot spots for marine biodiversity and they provide habitat for seaweeds, invertebrates, fish, seabirds, marine mammals. And we also recognize that kelp beds buffer the exposed coastlines from heavy waves and storms. We also know already that uh, there's quite a bit of spatial variability 
in bull kelp along the Oregon coast. Uh, but after that marine heat wave, we saw a substantial reduction at some sites after the marine heat wave, particular Orford Reef, Blanco Reefs, Humbug Mountain down in Brookings. And these uh, photographs on the right to show the Orford Reef bull kelp bed in 2014 when there was an abundant subsurface and surface canopy there and 2016, very little kelp, more context. Recent work at the global scale has tried to identify the ecological and economic value of the ecosystem services or benefits associated with kelp beds. And if we dig back through that, that paper, uh, looking particularly at bull kelp, uh, the key ecosystem services understood to be provided by bull kelp or fisheries production, nutrient cycling, and carbon removal. And the economic value is estimated at $64,000 to $147,000 per hectare per year, uh, primarily in terms of, of providing habitat for abalone and, um, and sea urchins. Now, uh, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has undertaken periodic surveys of the spatial extent and estimates of biomass of kelp throughout the state. And here, this histogram just shows a comparison of the, um, the values in 2010 and 2022. And what we can see here is that we've had some areas like the Blanco Reef and Orford Reefs in the middle where there's been substantial reduction of kelp. But other areas like Cape Arago, we're seeing a slight increase the Rogue Reef area, a slight decrease. Down south on the southern part, a substantial decrease. The spatial variability in the changes in our um, kelp. Uh, but overall, we've seen about a 66% reduction over the past decade. Uh, we used to have 536 hectares of bull kelp, and we're down to about 180 hectares of kelp. Now we can take that global estimate of the economic value and apply that directly to Oregon to come up with a general ballpark about what this means. So if we take that overall 66% reduction in the spatial extent of kelp from 2010, apply that, um, multiply it by the median economic value, which is about $100,000 per hectare, that um, equates to an economic loss in Oregon. Uh, back in 2010, our bull kelp beds were valued at about $56 million and now they're down to about $19 million. So that represents about a $36 million loss for Oregon at this point. Again, just a ballpark, uh, but if we use those most up-to-date values or so, uh, we got, we're looking at that kind of scale. Here's a more extreme example of our uh, recent aerial surveys down the coast at Brookings. And Brookings has seen a more uh, drastic reduction than we've seen statewide. Uh, down there around Chetco Point, the mouth of the Chetco River, about an 82% reduction in kelp uh, since our comparison time frame back in 2010. So we're down to about, uh, you know, six and a half or 2.6 hectares uh, down there, pretty low. And that's key habitat for red abalone. But we also know the bull kelp uh, beds persist at some sites and our aerial surveys are showing a very slight uh, increase at Cape Arago, up to about 26 hectares. And at the Rogue Reef area, a slight decrease from 76 hectares down to about 64 hectares. So some areas are persisting while others have undergone some major declines. So for our Oost project, then we uh, took that context and asked this general science question. How do the ecological characteristics of rocky reef habitats differ between areas that have experienced kelp loss versus area where kelp still persists. Our primary goal is to fill critical data gaps regarding these shifts at strategic conservation sites down along the south coast. And our objectives first are to just um, conduct new surveys in areas where kelp has undergone uh, recent transitions where uh, kelp beds have decreased and the habitats have transitioned into areas dominated by sea urchins or sea urchin barrens. Second objective is to conduct new surveys at areas where kelp beds have been persistent. And we assume or presume that ecological uh, communities still function in a typical manner. And our third objective for this project is to increase awareness 
um, of uh, kelp uh, communities and these recent changes that our, that our habitats are undergoing through sharing of data, disseminating information, and presenting uh, seminars and such uh, to let people know about what's going on. So our study areas are, are located down in the south coast, uh, roughly from Coos Bay down to the Oregon-California border in Brookings. We have seven specific study sites, and those are shown on the left here, Cape Arago, an area where kelp beds, uh, bull kelp beds are generally persisting. The Orford Reef and Nellie's Cove areas around Port Orford, where the kelp beds are in decline. Uh, Redfish Rock areas, uh, one of our uh, ODFW marine reserves that Kristen Don was in charge of for so many years, where kelp beds have generally persisted. Humbug Mountain, immediately south of that, where they're in decline. Uh, the Rogue Reef area, uh, where kelp beds still persist and is really the center for our commercial, viable commercial sea urchin fishery. And then down the south coast at Chetco Point, where kelp beds I showed you are in 80% decline. So there's a very interesting uh, off, off again, on again situation that we just don't have a good handle on. Why do they persist at some sites and decline at others? And what do the communities in the shallow subtitle look like when we compare areas where kelp has persisted versus where it has declined? Our approach here is to uh, conduct new underwater surveys with a diverse group of divers. So areas that are close to shore and easy to access, uh, we are engaging with a diversity of science divers. Those include the Cape Arago area, Nellie's Cove, uh, uh, Redfish Rock, Humbug Mountain, and down at Chetco Point. And then the offshore high risk areas that are difficult to get to where you only want really very serious uh, divers uh, out at Orford Reef and out at the Rogue Reef. We're engaging and working with the commercial sea urchin fishery. So our uh, partners in this um, for the nearshore work, uh, science divers have been headed up by Aaron Galloway, University of Oregon and his, his team. They've conducted new scuba dives where they record video and count and measure kelp and seaweeds, urchins, abalone and sea stars under a series of transects underwater. And Aaron has completed the work so far at Cape Arago, Port Orford and down at Chetco Point uh, over the last year. And over the coming year, coming up, uh, then we're going to continue to work with the new Reef Check Oregon divers uh, and with the commercial sea urchin divers, as I mentioned, for those uh, dangerous sites offshore. Uh, some of those sites, uh, this photograph in the middle here shows one of our staff, uh, Kendall Smith, uh, working with the commercial urchin divers there, Butterbaugh. And uh, when that big red abalone came up for a different project, to figure out uh, working on the genetics. Uh, when we were ready to send that red abalone back down to the bottom, uh, Butterbaugh just said, you know, this is too dangerous. He was being harassed by big sea lions underwater and uh, a little dangerous. We don't want to send uh, academic urchin divers, I mean, uh, academic science divers into that situation. But we're okay working with the commercial urchin divers in that situation. Okay, so what have we seen so far? Again, healthy kelp forest on the left, providing three-dimensional structure, complex habitat for diverse communities of invertebrates and fish, marine mammals, seabirds, uh, making that transition in many areas to urchin barrens, uh, which don't have that three-dimensional structure or uh, the biomass of understory seaweeds and kelp has been greatly reduced statewide at the level of 66% on the scale of 80% at, at particular areas. A dramatic change in the abundance and behavior of purple sea urchins extending from the typical shallow areas at the edge of kelp down into deeper water where they don't, uh, aren't normally found. And uh, a lot of grazing pressure there that has robbed um, abalone and other species of, of drift algae. Some important changes there. ODFW has been documenting these communities for a long time, uh, close to 20 years or so. And we've seen some uh, dramatic differences in the abundance of some of the echinoderms. On the left, of course, decreased abundance of sunflower sea stars and about 90% decrease in their abundance to the extent range-wide that they are 
uh, now being considered for status at the federal level as a um, threatened species, but also other species that are much poorer known. Uh, the giant sea star, Pisaster brevis finus, also suffering some great levels of decline in the shallow subtidal zone and in the bays and estuaries. That's one of the most important Pisaster sea stars uh, in the mouths of our bays and estuaries where they're voracious feeders on, on clams. Pisaster brevis finus, in trouble, hardly anything known about them. The Solaster species, Solaster stimpsoni, Solaster dawsoni, also in significant decline, and very little known about them. So we're documenting that on our Oregon coast. The middle category, uh, little change really in our, our data sets uh, for Pisaster ocracius. We saw a massive decline and Bruce was probably nodding his head. We were, we were concerned about possible ex local extinction of Pisaster ocracius early on in the mass mortality, um, but they have since recovered in many, many cases. We'll hear more details, I assume, from Bruce on that. So they've done well. Uh, Henricea, another species that has shown some great variability over time, but it's done okay. And then other species here, category C, that have really shown increased abundance over time. Red sea urchins that are the target for the commercial um, sea urchin fishery on the coast. The purple sea urchins, which have dramatically increased We've documented over 350 million new purple urchins at one reef, Orford Reef alone. Uh, and it's difficult to estimate what the magnitude of their population increase coastwide has been. And others like the sea star, the leather sea star, or Dermisterius imbricata, also have shown some, some increases. It's hard to sort out you know, what, um, what factors have really come to play uh, to, to affect these changes that we're seeing. So at this point, we're really adding more data uh, from new surveys, bringing that together to add new data points on here and establish the, the context of uh, change that's occurred to establish our new baselines. So our next steps for our project uh, in 2024, uh, continue to work under contract with the commercial urchin divers to do these new underwater surveys at four sites off the Orford Reef, um, well offshore, and uh, four sites at the Rogue Reef areas uh, where the fishery is still continuing. And then uh, next year, um, we'll also work with a group of science divers to do underwater surveys close to shore at Cape Arago, three sites, Nellie's Cove, uh, two sites, the Redfish Rocks areas, uh, the, the ODFW Marine Reserve, a couple of sites there, Humbug Mountain just south of that, and then also down at Chetco Point. Uh, we are also working with the Oregon Kelp Alliance to do controlled sea urchin culling at uh, Nellie's Cove and also down at Chetco Point. I won't talk about that because it's outside the scope of our Oost project. That's a project where we're um, working closely with, with that group. And then on the outreach uh, dissemination side, uh, we were talking about this um, situation quite a bit. So over the last year, presentations at the Oregon chapter of the American uh, Fishery Society meeting at the Hatfield Marine Science Center Research Summit. I presented a quick lightning talk about this at the Oost uh, Summit just a little bit ago. We've held public meetings, a couple of public meetings about the kelp abalone urchin situation down in Port Orford and in Brookings. And we just presented to the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, a couple of weeks ago. I wanted to raise that uh, meeting to your attention here. So in that presentation on December 15th to the Fish and Wildlife Commission, we asked the commission to suspend the recreational ab abalone fishery indefinitely. We're in lockstep with California on this and California Department of Fish and Wildlife, but it was very sobering to bring that proposal to the commission. And it was with a heavy heart that they granted that. And so that's the situation we're in. We've also, uh, my colleagues, Kendall Smith, Scott Groth, and myself, just put together the Conservation and Fisheries Management Plan for red abalone in Oregon. And we asked the commission to adopt that, which they did as well. So that document is being finalized and dressed up, should be available here um, very shortly. Okay, and outreach and dissemination plan for next year. We're gonna continue on with our campaign of, of uh, seminars and, and meetings. So we're uh, scheduled and submitted our abstract for the Oregon um, chapter conference in Bend coming up here. 
uh, uh, volunteered to give a research seminar at HMSC about this, uh, also down at OIMB in their lecture series. And then uh, we'll offer and of course um, submit and ask to be considered to be able to give a, a talk at the Oregon State of the Coast Conference, uh, the Sea Otter Science Symposium coming up, the Land Sea Symposium. Uh, we'll also participate in the Marine Reserves outreach activities and then ongoing social media outreach through ODFW, uh, through the Oregon Kelp Alliance. Uh, we hope to partner up with uh, the outreach side of the Oregon Sea Grant Program, see if we can put together some type of outreach activity and then plan to hold a coastal resource manager workshop at the end of the project to share these data sets. And I think that's where I wanna leave it. Kept questions there. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share our project. Wow, that is super exciting. I remember thinking about this kind of work uh, conceptually with the OOST five years ago, and it's wonderful to see it happening. In the interest of time, I'd like to invite um, board members or members of the public to drop your questions into the chat. And what I'll do is I'll take that and I'll send that in an email to you, Steve, and then you can respond um, that way, because I'm sure there's questions and I wish we could schedule enough time for robust discussion on all of this, but I want to make sure that Dr. Menge um, also is, uh, is able to give a full presentation and we'll just push the agenda back a little bit with our break. It's uh, We have lots of flex time in the second half of the agenda to make up for being a little bit behind schedule right now. So yeah, any questions in the chat, I'll copy and paste those into an email or you can respond to them directly in the chat too, but I'd rather not do that while Dr. Menge is presenting lest we distract from his time. So um, with that, uh, we'd love to hear an update on your research, Dr. Menge. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Can you all see that? Okay. Uh, very briefly, I'm a professor at Oregon State University. I've been here for, well, since 1977 or thereabouts. Um, and I've been working mostly on the Oregon coast ever since. Uh, I've also worked in other places around the world, including New Zealand and Panama and New England and various other places, Chile. Uh, but most of my effort for the last three or four decades has been on the Oregon coast. So my uh, OOS project is titled, as is shown there, and it's involved a bunch of people in the lab, all listed here. Let me... Uh, go to slideshow. Is it real? Yeah, okay. All right, and besides this, there are other uh, folks that have helped fund uh, at least some of this research. And as the title says, this is, uh, the used work is sort of embedded within the context of some, a number of long-term studies that we've been uh, undertaking for, uh, 20 plus years, but also involves some new work, which I will focus on today. So the overall context is the, the stability of coastal ecosystems in the face of climate change. That's one of our big challenges these days is how uh, global ecosystems are gonna respond. <clears throat> and uh, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, five projects that were underway, uh, three of which will be the main focus. First one is to look at the abundance and colonization of intertidal kelp, which is not something that's been really investigated much at all. The second project is related, and that's looking at what's called the phenology or sort of the life history and the reproductive output of intertidal kelp. The third one is a long-term project that I won't say much about, which is the persistence of low intertidal uh, macrophyte communities. The fourth one is another long-term study testing the resilience and recovery of macrophyte communities. And then in the course of this work over the past summer, 
something new has come up, and I want to spend a little bit of time on that at the end, which is a novel pattern of muscle mortality, which we're still not sure what the cause is, diseases, toxins, possibly other things are involved. And I'm, as I said, I'm going to really focus mostly on these three things right here. Uh, some background, uh, <clears throat> we have two things going on in the environment. Well, many things, but two things that I want to focus on. One is that we've had a chronic increase in the temperatures of water and air uh, around the world, but these are our sites along the Oregon coast, ranging from uh, Cape Fallweather in the north down to Cape Blanco area in the south. And you can see, although there's fluctuations through time, the steady, uh, the, the trend is steady increases pretty much everywhere along the coast. We've also had these acute perturbations that uh, Steve mentioned with sea star wasting disease, which was essentially never occurred before 2014. And then suddenly we had it, and then it's been chronic ever since. Uh, and then the marine heat wave that uh, Steve also referred to that combined with an El Nino to produce this, this big increase uh, from the average condition in temperature over the years of 14 through about 16 or 17. And the consequences of these things are shown by these two slides below. So the first project is uh, a project taken over by my student, Sarah Selke. She's a, uh, I think she's now in her third year. And her project was to look at kelp colonization abundance and grazer abundance of rocky intertidal kelps, again, which have relatively, had relatively little focus. Um, the design of her study was to look at six study sites. Uh, she collected data at least monthly, uh, sometimes more often, and in the winter, maybe less. In total, she's looked at six species along uh, permanently marked transects, and in some cases, permanently marked quadrats. And just this picture on the on the left on the top here just shows how the transects are laid out at a site. I think this is Boiler Bay, maybe. And then the bottom one shows a quadrat in the way she samples within that. And so she lays out these transects along the line and samples uh, at every uh, every uh, every meter along the tape. She uses these half a meter on the side quadrats. And then the bottom shows the permanently marked quadrats that she looks at for the sea palm and uh, Liminaria sedentaria. So uh, that's a quick intro, but uh, here are some results from her work. Uh, she started uh, looking at sea cabbage, which is the uh, Hedophil and Cecil species. These are, this was looked at at six sites. It's the most ubiquitous kelp along the coast. Uh, starting in early March at uh, one site and extending into December at several of the sites. Novel result is that this species recruits year round, which is, was a surprise because we thought that it recruited really mostly just in the spring and early summer. So she's been finding new recruits uh, even into December. The sea palm, Postelsia, is, uh, recruits mostly in the, well, the recruits appear in the sports, the small belts here in uh, March. And uh, then they're done and then they grow and then they, they die because they are an annual species. Wing kelp is Elaria. And uh, this is the first data we have on recruitment of, of this species. She was able to do it at three sites. The feather boa, uh, she's been able to look at it at all the sites. It's also pretty ubiquitous. Um, <clears throat> One thing to notice in all of these things is the variability among the different sites. They're, they're not all doing, the, the species are not all doing the same thing at all the sites. Uh, some more species, the strat kelp, which is the Litorhino litoralis, it's, uh, sorry, the Sonyopsis 
Litorellus, which is uh, a wave exposed species. She has that at three sites. This is a novel result as well. Uh, nobody has ever really documented the Sonyopsis recruitment or even much else about it. Uh, um, Dr. Menge, yeah. I, um, I should have mentioned this earlier. I was kind yeah. of just going along with it, but I, it would be more useful if you were in presentation mode um, for our screen where we're seeing a presenter mode, I think it's called, where we see your next animation in addition to your current uh, slide. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that sooner. Um, it's just now with the graphs, it's beginning, it's it's a little bit hard to see with the sizing. Okay, I guess I've got the wrong screen up. So you're seeing this where my, my cursor is? It's correct. You're not seeing this over here. That's right. Okay. Huh. I wonder how I'm gonna switch that. That's why I didn't say something because I know how challenging that could be when you're in presentation, but it I, is. I think, I think it's the display settings, Bruce. I think under there you can switch which one okay. is presenting at the very top. That? It's sort of in the, the menu. Well, I don't know. It's above the presentation. There's sort of, I can see three things. It says display settings is one of them right above the. Oh, there screen. we go. Okay. Yeah. I think yep. you can. I think there's an option in there. Swap. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm very sorry about that. I, I was not aware. And uh, thanks for butting in, Laura. I wish you'd done it earlier, but that's... Should that's... have. Forgive me for waiting. Go continue, please. Okay. Sorry. Should I go back and start over? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, the uh, okay, so we're up to the dense clumped kelp. This is also something that's been very uh, minimally studied. Uh, it's uh, common in sandy areas, and in fact, uh, it's very difficult to get to because most of the time, the at least the whole fasts are buried in sand, and sometimes the whole thing is buried. And then finally, uh, this shows what the uh, different species were recruiting to, the, the kind of surface that they were recruiting to. And you can see here that there are different substrata, so bare rock, barnacles, coral and algae, different types of algae, holdfasts, mussels, sand, sponges, and then upright coral and algae, or turfy algae. And you can see here some really striking things that Pedophyllum, the uh, sea cabbage settles in upright coral and algae mostly, although a bunch of other things as well. Bare rock is the primary uh, substratum for <clears throat> the, uh, the dense clump kelp. And Postelsia settles mostly on barnacles. Okay, the second project is um, done by my, <clears throat> one of my students, Megan Davis. Uh, she is a PhD student, also in her third year. And what, what she was looking at was the reproductive ecology of the kelp. She was able to set up uh, transects and, and studies of four of the four most common species that she could get to. Uh, they're shown here. Uh, she set up permanent transects at five sites along three cates and collected 10 samples per species per site each time she sampled. She laid out her transects along, uh, uh, like those that I showed you earlier, and she sampled at intervals of every meter. She took photographs, and then she sampled one individual haphazardly for sampling uh, at each, in each uh, transect. She did this again uh, twice per month or as often as she could, depending on what the tide was looking like. So just to give you an idea of what she's looking for when she looks at these kelp, this dark area here, this is a blade of phytophyllum, you know, I think. This is where the reproductive cells are found, they're called sori. And you can see the darker color versus the lighter color. That's, that's what she's after. 
And here is one of her plots. It's got multiple species in it. Uh, it's got the feather boa. It's got uh, malaria in it. Uh, it's got a number of different taxa. And so this is where she would collect her samples from. She would then take her samples in a cooler to the lab and she would um, put it through a process where she took some of the tissue of the sporophyll, submerged it in instant ocean solution to induce spore release. And then she counted the number of spores released using what's called a hemocytometer under a, a microscope. So that's shown here. And right there is where the, these uh, microscopic cells are located. And she quantified them by counting the number in a certain area of the hemocytometer. So her results, uh, here's for the wing kelp, Elaria marginata. Um, she had three sites until this site uh, at Tokati Kuchman got buried by sand. So she was only able to get a couple of samples there, but she got uh, samples at the other two sites. And again, notice that there's differences between the sites. The sea cabbage, Hedophyllum, uh, it doesn't reproduce until late in the fall. So you can see here all of her uh, reproductive information was obtained in, uh, in November, December. So they don't reproduce in the summer. The scrap kelp, this, this difficult to study Lysoniopsis, um, she found uh, these, this pattern. Uh, she was able to get to the sites through uh, into September, but uh, winter storms have made it difficult since then. And the sea palm uh, is an annual species, so it's not actually present in the winter. So this uh, encompasses the entire period during which they might reproduce. And again, you can see that there are uh, differences among the sites. Uh, lots of reproduction at this site uh, which is Yahat Beach, and not so much at this site, Fogarty Creek, which actually has one of the biggest uh, Postelsia beds along the coast. So that's really interesting. So to summarize quickly, uh, several novel results have been obtained. Uh, the quantification of spatiotemporal variation in recruitment in our reproductive patterns and in their reproductive output are really uh, basically novel. We haven't really had this information before. And hopefully we'll be able to continue this on in the future to see how these species respond to variation in ocean temperature and whatever else is gonna hit us. The surprises were uh, at least a couple, persistent recruitment of the sea cabbage and variable reproductive output in space among the sites. In 2024, they're, all, they're both gonna continue these things, but add some additional things, looking at kelp growth, kelp size, its, it's diameter in the whole fast and length. And we'll start somewhat earlier for most of it. Um, one of the other long-term projects, I'm just gonna whiz by because time is uh, of the essence here. This is a project that we've been doing for the last decade. And uh, I've talked about this a number of times before, not to this group, but what we're finding with this is that the recovery, so let me explain this. This is uh, a plot in uh, the summer. This is a, a nearby plot that we cleared in the summer, and this is what you see after one year. And here's the recovery after one year. You can see here that, that it doesn't look at all like what this looks like or that looks like, which it did originally, and it's, now it's mostly pollen algae and gooseneck barnacles. So we've been doing this year after year. We start the experiment over and over again every year. And what we found is that they're recovering more and more slowly through time. That's a concern. Uh, the second project is one that was started with Sally Hacker and me in 2006. 
and has been maintained ever since. Uh, our student, Zach Munier, has picked it up and done uh, work on it for his thesis. So here is the original design. We had four different types of treatment, a control, and then three different types of removals. And this over here just shows what happened in one of the uh, removal plots from 2009 through 2022. Uh, this is a plot that happens to be down in California. And you can see it transitioned from kelp to mussels. So there was a, a fairly major change there. And what he's found is that there are a number of cases where um, species uh, have transitioned, or the system has transitioned from one domination by one group to another, often with kelp transitioning to uh, mussels or something else. So that's also of concern. And then finally, the the new thing that we've come up with was this subtle mass mortality of mussels. You can see here, uh, we started seeing last summer uh, many, hundreds to thousands of individual dead mussels, which were surrounded by live ones. So here's a dead one, here are my arrows. Here's a dead one in the middle of each picture, but these are all uh, live mussels all around them. That was really puzzling. We've seen occasional dead mussels like that in the past, but it's usually not uh, a huge number of them like we started seeing last summer. All the sizes of mussels are affected, including the really big lunkers like those on the right and the small ones like those on the left. Uh, the mortality varied spatially. And as shown here, this is the mean number of dead mussels per square meter per sample at a bunch of sites, seven of them. You can see there is also variability in space. And not shown is that this trend, this pattern, is still going on. It persisted into December. Uh, we sent some samples out for histology to try to figure out what's going on with the mussels. And what has been found is that the digestive tract has a number of anomalies where basically cells are detaching uh, from the liner of the gut and uh, detaching within the lumen of, of these uh, digestive tracts. So there are anomalies that are not normal. These are, um, according to the histologist, uh, Ralph Elston, these are signs that the organism is probably in digestive stress. Even though there's food out there, they're unable to process it. And this makes them susceptible to mortality. And we've got some recent evidence looking at uh, eDNA, environmental DNA, which suggests that uh, last summer there was a lot of, there were a lot of uh, taxa of toxic dinoflagellates in the water. The red shows the toxic taxa that were in the samples, the blue shows the non toxic taxa. And you can see there are a lot of something like 21 different species of toxic dinoflagellates were in the water at these four different sites along the coast ranging again from Cape Fallweather down to Cape Perpetual. Okay, some conclusions. So the big picture here is that a major concern with climate change is how foundation species are going to be affected. These are the, the, the species that are critically important in determining the abundance and structure of the system. And we have uh, key foundation species. All the kelps, both intertidal and subtidal, as, as uh, Steve has pointed out, and mussels are critically important species. They harbor a lot of other species, so they help maintain diversity. Uh, they are key members of food webs. Uh, they're just critically important in so many ways. And it's critical for mitigation planning and resource management to understand how the dynamics of these taxa are affected by warming and by acute stresses. So the EAST funding has really greatly enhanced our efforts in these directions. 
and also helps to build uh, scientific capacity. We've got two PhD students working on some of this work now. Uh, another one is going to be starting on it this coming spring, at least one. And another one has is nearing the end of her PhD. We're looking at, again, some of these same sorts of issues. So I'm done. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Mange. Um, I'd like to do something a little bit different here just because we're a little behind on time. We had a couple of great questions come forth to me. I'm going to put those in the chat. One question for uh, Steve Rumwell and one for Bruce Menge. If you could just consider those questions over a really brief five minute break, then when we come back, just be prepared to give a fairly succinct response to these questions so that we can move into the next part of our agenda. But I would hate to leave this without having an opportunity to ask a few questions and have response, even though we're a little behind time. So I'll drop those into the chat right now and we'll take a break until 1.20. When we come back, we'll get a quick response and then we'll move into the next part of our agenda, all right? Um, so a uh, couple of questions in the chat, um, earnestly asking for a very succinct response <laughs> as we're a little behind schedule. So first of all, um, the question for Steve um, about what research is needed to ID the key biological factors to support informed restoration recovery programs. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. So, you know, key research needed is really what are the effects of these changes in the communities on the um, production of propagules, as uh, Dr. Mengi talked about, the sori, those um, spores being produced by kelps, but also uh, the, the microscopic uh, embryos and larvae of sea stars, of uh, abalone, and, uh, and um, sea urchins as well. So we really don't know, you know what's controlling the reproductive output and how variable that has been from, from year to year. Um, but that's gonna be essential in terms of trying to restore kelp, uh, deliberate actions by, by humans to try to enhance the populations. I'd rather use that term enhance because we're trying to enhance existing populations rather than completely restore um, populations from areas where they've been wiped out. Uh, so we're, we need research on that in terms of reproductive output, and then also just you know trying to figure out uh, the very site-specific differences. You know, a key take-home from Dr. Mengi's work is that we see not only year-to-year -year changes, but site-specific variability. And so what you could figure out one year may not make sense the next year. Uh, Thank so, you for that. Uh, yeah. And for Dr. Menge, uh, what observations help us look at resiliency to climate? So um, one of the experiments that I skipped over is one way of looking at the resiliency of these systems is to do uh, removal experiments and see how quickly they recover and whether or not the original structure is restored or not. And uh, you refer to a genetic or other sorts of relationships. Uh, one of the things that's curious about the muscle work is that not all muscles are dying. It's just a few here and there. And so that suggests to me that there are genetic, uh, potentially genetic, possibly uh, just acclimation differences in the uh, among the individuals in the population so that uh, some of them are resistant and others are weaker and, and don't resist whatever the mortality factor might be, which we think, as I said, is is likely to be uh, toxins from dinoflagellates. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's a first step. Yeah, these are complex topics, so I think uh, I think there's always going to be room for follow up and direct communication as well. Um, briefly for Steve, um, any funding outlook for your 2024 work and beyond? 
Yeah, so we uh, have received um, some financial support from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, their competitive state wildlife grants. Uh, so that's allowed us to uh, conduct some of some of the um, ongoing work there. We hope to be able to get a renewal. That's nationwide competitive, uh, and, but that means that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is recognizing the urgent uh, need for new data along the Oregon coast, and that we're worthy of of establishing uh, programs. Uh, these are dollars that are tied up in trying to keep species off the endangered species list. So they're looking at our Pycnopodia, looking at our abalone. Uh, we categorize those as species of greatest conservation need in those proposals and articulate the need for new data to um, gain a better understanding about those species. Thank you. All right, uh, much appreciation to both of you and good luck with your field season coming up. Uh, moving on in the agenda, um, we had a kind of a big deal. We, we had a summit. So, um, most of you were there. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let Lisa kind of walk us through some of the findings from the summit and what the next steps are. See, uh, Lisa? Yep. Thank you, Laura. Um, so what I wanted to do was just briefly describe how the document was put together and its purpose. Though, So this is sort of our internal document. It's just a reflection of what happened at the summit um, and not our outward facing document. That outward facing piece will be something that our communications team is gonna help us put together once um, the board has determined that that these, some of the elements of this are final. So for those that are participating in today's call that aren't familiar with the history of this meeting, there was one in 2016. At that time, we brought together about 40 individuals, experts, uh, scientists and researchers in 2016 in Newport. And we asked them to help us describe what the highest priority coastal and ocean research and monitoring uh, research topics were for the state of Oregon. And from that, the seeds were planted for us to seek funding in support of some of those high priority projects of which the outcomes have been almost $2 million in investments in ocean acidification and hypoxia and near shore research and monitoring projects. So we felt it was time to come back together after 2016 uh, because of the amount of time that had elapsed, climate change stressors, it just seemed appropriate to have people come back and sort of revisit what we did in 2016 and take a fresh look forward from 2020 uh, three onward. And so the whole purpose of it was to do that, was to reflect and then look forward. We had about 65 people in attendance. It was an invitation only event. The way the document is uh, formatted is we just described what the presentations were. We did have a keynote speaker. It was Liz Whiteman, <clears throat> excuse me, who's the executive director of the California Ocean Science Trust. Um, and we were formed in similar ways in both of those states. And as was mentioned on today's call, I think by Karina, we are the only two states uh, in the nation that have this type of an ocean science trust dedicated to um, science and research uh, relative to oceans. And they're both on the West Coast and in adjoining states. We also had some pretty strategic state of the science lightning talks at the summit where we asked people to submit ideas for topics that they felt were relevant and pressing, and then asked them to do some background research on those topics to provide sort of a comprehensive view for summit participants. In the summit report, you can click on those um, and it will take you to those presentations that are online on our website. And then what we did is we busted the group of 65 up into four teams. Those teams each had a facilitator and note taker and we asked them to do that reflection work, think about the 2016 priorities, how would they change through time? Um, how would we describe new priorities? What are the most pressing and relevant 
uh, urgent ocean priority and uh, management issues that Oregon needs to address in the short term and long term. And then we attempted in this report to categorize them by theme, um, just as a way to help organize some of the thoughts. So you can see we've got data and climate and fisheries and seafood. We, the third of the four big questions was what research questions need to be answered to, to best support decision makers in making sound ocean policy. And we got some great concepts and ideas relative to species and habitats, data, energy, blue carbon, just a whole lot of really great topics. And then the last question was, how would you prioritize all of this? So we got this big laundry basket of ideas, some of which we started to parse out into themes. So we asked people, what criteria would you use to prioritize? And each team thought about those criteria. And then we asked them using those criteria, how would you prioritize? So for the report um, sort of ends with a description of what those criteria are, some draft Oregon ocean and coastal research themes and questions that are in these buckets about improving fundamental scientific understanding, monitoring data and information management, management and governance, et cetera. And so then the report ends with next steps. And this is really the most important part today. Um, the first recommendation is that the OOST should take this rich content and develop one overarching goal statement to characterize its research priorities. And so pretty quickly during the conference or during the summit, we pulled from a lot of different ideas and cobbled together this one. So something for us to talk about today. The second um, recommendation is that we should use the proceedings from the summit to evaluate and revise, if necessary, the priority funding areas. And so we attempted to characterize Again, all of that rich content, and it seemed to land in six big buckets. Distribution, abundance, structure, diversity, and interactions of marine and coastal species, characterizing our understanding of changes in ecosystem structure and function, et cetera. Building the understanding of the interconnected relationships among society and ecosystems, et cetera. Um, addressing the cumulative impacts of multiple stressors documenting anthropogenic effects and actionable solutions. And I want to emphasize here, there was a great deal of discussion at the conference um, about actionable solutions, um, making sure that the work that's being done is driving towards actionable solutions. And the last is to develop indicators that provide understanding of those ecological associations and interactions in the ecosystems. And we want to talk about those. And then the third piece, the third recommendation is that we should adopt a list of project prioritization criteria. So each of the teams at the summit discussed in their own small work groups what they thought the prioritization criteria should be. We should look at that list, see what you think about it, and land on a good handful of those that the OOST can use to prioritize research projects. And the last recommendation, is that we should keep a categorized list of those priority research questions and then consider it as we receive funding to implement competitive um, RFPs that we should have those lists available and ready and think about them in these four big buckets that I just described previously. So I guess before we dive into those four recommendations and get your input and feedback, I just wanted to open it up and see if anybody has any initial comments they'd like to make about the summit, any board members, um, anything you wanna reflect on uh, or comment on before we, we get into those four, four areas. I am. Oh, okay. Uh, Kristen. Yeah, use your little hand symbol because I can only see so many boxes on my screen while the um, presentation is also up. So, and actually, Lisa, <laughs> maybe turn off the presentation for the uh, dialogue conversation. Got it. Thank you. 
Thanks. I just had a question of how many attendees were researchers versus how many were resource managers? Ooh, that's a good question. Honestly, I'd have to go through the list. We did try to get a diversity of individuals representing a lot of different um, backgrounds from academic, and we had a lot of folks from university, policy folks, management folks, and hardcore research scientist folks. So the invitations went out with sort of that, that picture in mind. Yeah, it seemed from the faces I recognize, it seemed pretty diverse. I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, we all have our unconscious biases, especially when we're like an expert or like, you know, passionate about certain subjects. And so sometimes that can kind of skew. So I'm just trying to get an idea of like, maybe if we're aware things might be skewed in the, in the report from the outputs from the, anyway. <laughs> okay, that's a good point. Any other, yeah, Ted? Um. Kind of in uh, align with what Kristen, Kristen just uh, mentioned was, would it be possible to include the list of invitees uh, in the report and, and maybe some information in a condensed way of the, uh, uh, the distribution of expertise uh, and or their uh, distribution by organization, organization type? So you get a sense of... of uh, Know, who the, you know, who was involved in, in providing input? Yes, we can definitely do that. The expertise piece might be a little bit tougher unless we were to interview each individual and have them characterize their expertise, but we could definitely do it by organization type and title, which would give you a pretty good feel if they're in a policy, academic, or other realm. Okay. Um, Another thing came, occurred to me as I was looking through this was um, with this suggestions of, of prioritizing research. And this is more maybe a more general question is, you know, what do we know about the, the preferences or uh, of, of coastal communities for ecological resources in the, in the coastal zone that then might inform, you know, how we, maybe go to this list and say, oh, well, you know, number one was uh, sea urchins. I just pick something. And then we say, well, what is the research that people say needs to be done about sea urchins? Uh, as opposed to um, some other uh, approach to um, winnowing this uh, wonderful list of opportunities and ideas. Karina? Thanks, yeah. Um I mean, my comments might echo similarly. One of the, I, I feel like it's a really great summary of sort of the current um, bleeding edge, if you will, of research interests for the Oregon coast and questions to answer. But I'm not sure that we have enough information to respond to one of the, you know, suggestions, which was pretty prominent as Ted noted. And, but I'll add also resource managers, like what are the problems that need to be solved or that, you know, collectively, the coastal communities, state of Oregon resource, um, dependent communities, like what, what do they, what do we need answered to support actionable um, state policies that would help, you know, move things forward? That might be a place to look as well. And I think, you know, you're not going to get that from just a scientific body of, um, um, of folks. So I think somehow merging those two, um, in our in our thinking, uh, or perhaps even inquiry going forward, might be a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Yeah, I, I wondered if some of the work out of the Marine Reserves Program, looking at um, you know values of coastal communities uh, as they would be affected by the establishment of, uh, of 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 the Marine Reserves, and maybe. The, you know, more recently, how, how they how maybe those values have been uh, affected by the longer term presence of reserves that could might provide some information. Okay, Keith. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that, you know, from a logistics standpoint, um, I'm looking at the three things that I that I just wrote down that I heard was number one actionable solutions and I, I strongly support that and that helps us get to 
um, kind of the problem solving, you know, which problems are we looking at as well? Um, the priorities, let me hold on that for a second. The categories is an important one as well, because if we were able to do that, if we're able to look at what are the eight or nine categories of research that are funded, then we're able to look at that in kind of a before after control impact way and look at what's get, what's returning us the, the biggest bang for the buck, what's addressing the problems that you know are, are the ones that we think are the most important to do. Uh, we did this with the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund uh, many, many years ago. And it was interesting what we found across nine categories, what we thought were going to be the best return on investment projects were sometimes not. And so yeah, that categorization does help. The final thing I'll say is that prioritization is really hard. It's really tricky and it's really difficult because who's to say what's the difference between priority one and priority five? The answer is there's no difference. If they're a priority, they're a priority. And so um, we'll get to, that will be a difficult one, but I think the, the exercise will be helpful as long as we condition and understand that it's it's not going to be a perfect uh, conclusion. And so I, I kind of use the term sequencing a little bit. You know, what are the sequences of actions a little bit that helps us get away from, the, you know, the, the, uh, the pitfalls, the, the traps of prioritization uh, explicitly, so. Great comments. Yeah, thanks for that, Keith. Kristen? Thanks. Yeah, a couple different thoughts. One, um, regarding some of the data information from the Marine Reserves Program on coastal communities' interests and what they see as the biggest threats to the ocean. There was, in our Human Dimensions Program, research that highlighted that. And then, I, you know, Karina, I didn't know if maybe Sea Grant's also maybe done some research that also talks about you know, what are the biggest threats or what are communities' interests? So I just want to throw that out there as one. And then the second is I'm kind of seeing this workshop report as like a source of information, again, kind of with a slant from like the scientific community and maybe some policy managers. But I think there's some other criteria we'll have to come up with kind of to Keith's point of how to prioritize. Like one, are we really just talking about only state waters or are we also talking about further offshore? Two, um, is there other funding sources that would actually be able to already fund this? You know, what is Boost's role versus other funding sources? Um, and again, I think of C grant and C grants um, grants that they give out. You know, we don't want to duplicate that. You know, we're kind of unique, so maybe those are something we need to work through. Um, yeah, just those kind of other sets of criteria, you know, how likely is this to maybe lead to a next step? So anyway, just some other ideas. I don't think this report was supposed to, was doing that. I think, again, this is kind of information to feed in to help us start to prioritize. But yeah, those are just my comments. Thanks, Kristen. That's exactly Thanks. right. Um, no assumptions were made that the board considers this a priority or that this should be the first in the sequence or it's really, it's intended just to gather what happened at that event. Um, Keith and then Karina. Karina. Okay, great. Um, Kristen is gonna mention some of the things that I was thinking about. One of the, um, I was thinking about the work that Representative Gomberg is doing uh, to, you know, bring more uh, funding into the Marine Reserves Program. Um, I think that, you know, who know, the recommendations out of the Marine Reserves Report was to sustain the excellent work in the Human Dimensions Program. Um, so, you know, there's that. Um, sea Grant has done some work uh, and we've had a transition recently in personnel. So we are about to, we are considering candidates right now, finalists for our human dimensions of coastal systems position. So we anticipate having some new life in that space uh, and ability to do, take on some of that work um, uh, going forward. So I just wanted to earmark that. And that leads me to um, what Kristen started to go uh, along, which was what are the strategic, what is the unique niche for Oregon Ocean Science Trust? Um, in Sea Grant, one of the tools we've used in the past is to develop, based on our strategic plan, strategic criteria for what we will work on and what we might say, you know what, that's somebody else's or it's not really in our area of expertise or where we can provide unique value. 
And I wonder if that might be a useful exercise for us to go through to develop kind of a framework of strate strategic criteria about how we um, start to prioritize where we can have the most impact. Um, you know, long-term monitoring is super important, right? Is that OOST's primary impact space? Um, it does support decision-making. It does support understanding what's going on, what's happening with different interventions, whether those be anthropogenic or climatic or otherwise. Um, or is that something that really our state-funded uh, folks should be um, charged with doing and given support for? I don't know. So just, they just put those out there as things that we should think of. You got me. Okay. So Laura, I am I'm looking at the time and I'm wondering if our time would be better spent today talking about should we should we do another day planning session where we get our new board and everyone together and start really hammering through some of this because I think this is going to be difficult to do at quarterly meetings that are 3 hours long. And we got so much done that one day in Newport when we had everybody together. I mean, we cranked out a strategic plan. Um, so I just want to throw that out there, what folks think about that idea of getting together for just a, a workshop, a one-day workshop to hammer out some of this. I'm seeing some thumbs up animated and also <laughs> real ones. And um, I, I am, I'm really liking that recommendation. I would love to see how our comms team, whom we're gonna hear from next, can take and help winnow some of this down before we do that work because there's just so many words to get through, right? And I, I don't wanna get into a big wordsmithing you know, day because there is so much here. So let's see what our professional comp teams can do to try to distill some of this. And at that point, we'll also have the inventory of ocean research organizations completed and that will help us maybe see where we had some blind spots in our summit. We're aware that we had blind spots in our summit um, regarding being inclusive of all organizations, entities, et cetera, in the ocean space. So that would help us be more strategic in going out and um, interfacing in you know whatever way is meaningful for that that other kind of entity um yeah i like this i'm wondering if we would just take our april scheduled meeting and make that the work session um the problem is i was not going to be able to attend that meeting in person. I, I'll be actually attending the Decade of the Ocean in Barcelona, Spain, which is super <laughs> exciting for me, taking the opportunity to spend the whole month there, however. So um, I won't be here in person for that meeting. So we could either schedule that um, one day session in advance, like in March and do that in lieu of the April meeting or do it in addition to what kind of thoughts might um, might our membership have about those two options? I mean, I'd rather go to Spain with you and meet there, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm okay with either of those options, but I do like the idea of having us a dedicated time to work through these, this, these criteria, et cetera. Be good bonding. <laughs> yeah. So perhaps we could schedule um, another, just an additional planning session in March, mid to kind of late March. That'll give our comms team some time to distill this through to something that we're not going to necessarily go out public facing with in advance of us coming together, but it would give us something to react to. And also, um, 
yeah, give us all some more time to work with the document a little bit. That sounds great, Laura. And I'm looking at the time now and our comms team isn't going to be on until two o'clock. I'm wondering if you might want to give anybody else um, that's not on the board an opportunity if they want to make any comments about the summit or I, I, it's your call. Absolutely. Um, we, I don't know that anybody, yeah, the, is the, the summer report proceedings, is that up on our website already? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, if anybody um, has any feedback for us so far on what you've uh, either experienced in the summit or read subsequent to, um, be happy to allow some time for that. Peggy. Thank you, Laura. This is, I'm Peggy Joyce. I'm a board member of the Oregon of the Ocean Policy Advisory Council, and um, spent many years trying to get money for Oost. So I'm just so delighted to see you guys working, work more, work faster. Uh, and you know, two million dollars. I'm sorry, people, we need way, way more money than that. That is pathetic, to tell you the truth. I mean, the city of Corvallis wastes millions of dollars just trying to think about how they want to spend money. And I'm like, really? Come on, boys and girls. We are so far past that deadline right now. So I'm here because I love Oos, first of all. I feel really... Um, I'm very interested in what you guys are doing, but I also would like to know in what way OPAC and OOST can support each other and work collaboratively together. Because as I read through all of your materials, you know, we're going along very similar paths. I mean, right now, OPAC is being asked to look at the wind energy proposals that BOEM is trying to shove down our throats. And there's a lot of pushback from uh, the, the committee on that happening and how do we manage our own sea coast. So although we're not exactly in the same space, we, our interests are the Oregon coast. So surely we could harness our energy and our I don't know what, but I'm just throwing that out there as something to think about. I, I would just love to see more collaboration done, um, just as you all have collaborated with scientists and researchers. We just we need to get more juice out of our, you know, boards and you know people who have an interest but never get funded for anything. Yeah, thank you for that and. You know, we had a um, we had a strong interaction, Oost and OPAC together when Oost was fundraising for the Marine Reserves Assessment, and OPAC was running the um, was running the actual um, assessment process, and it worked really well. Um, we're complementary organizations in many ways, but I think that part of our strategic plan that um, we now have for the first time is going to direct us to go out into the world, into the state, and be more um, proactive in having these dialogues with partners throughout the state and OPAC is high on that list. So uh, what I anticipate seeing, and some of this is gonna be, we'll talk about this in terms of some of our capacity building is getting our communications team to help arm us with some good um, presentations, one pagers, communication devices that either as board members or as hired contractors, we can go out and, and be more proactive with those uh, relationships. So Laura, it sounds like we'll, um, 
hold these folks for a potential date in March, and then we'll work uh, with everyone to come up with a good agenda for the meeting to where we're sure we hit the highlights of what the board feels like they want to discuss. And then we'll get that agenda finalized and get the room reservations and everything taken care of. Um, and your last comment, Laura, was such a great segue to the communications and Corey Archer is, is here. Um, she just joined us. She is with uh, True Wind Collaborative, part of an amazing group of people with Sprout Partners. So there's three entities involved in that, of which Corey is one. Kayla Anderson is the second, um, and she's uh, with Riparian Media and does a lot of work with social media. Um, and the third one is Nicole Smith with Sprout. So Corey, if you are ready, um, and it looks like you're, I don't see any other hands up. If you're ready, I think we're ready to start. Laura, are you good with that? We do. Keith, did you have your hand up uh, towards the end of that? last conversation before we move on. Thanks, Laura. I did, and I'll make it a quick comment, and it's it, it applies also to the communications part, but we did in the summit, uh, there was a good theme established about getting work, uh, getting out into the community, and it's been raised here as well, <clears throat> and making sure that we coordinate and that we derive and we put into our strategic plan what we hear from the public and how we interact with the public. And the reason I bring that up now is because it's important, especially from our representative standpoint, I believe, how do we make sure that as we communicate, we communicate it in a way that is transferable to the state legislature so they hear us clearly and that uh, they understand that we are not just researchers and board members, that we are working within the communities and that becomes more supportable, I think, from the, uh, the state legislature side. And I think that we do our representatives some favors by making sure that we include that. Great, thank you. All right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, I'll just launch right into things. Um, but first, my name is Corey Archer. Lisa introduced me, I'm with True Wind Collaborative and part of a three person team for the communications team for OOST. Um, I have a couple of slides, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here in a moment. And what I want to do today is walk you through the draft communications plan that we've started to develop. Um, once I walk through it, really welcome any uh, dialogue, discussion, other ideas, reactions to what we've started to put together. Um, but I want to start by saying really excited to be working with you, uh, excited to meet all of you, and hopefully eventually get to know you all a little bit more one-on-one uh, -on -one as well. So let me get my screen share going and we'll get into things. As I'm getting transitioned here as well, I should say um, it's likely not just me joining today. I think we'll have uh, Kayla from our team as well. So you may see her pop in and uh, she's part of our, our team here. Okay, can you see my screen? I'm not getting my normal little box around it like I typically do. Okay, awesome. Uh, can I ask too, Lisa, uh, can you see my, my like bar at the bottom, my computer bar? in the screen share? No, we're seeing you in presentation mode. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. Things look a little wonky for me today on the Zoom presentation. All right, so here we have our draft communications plan. Um, I'm going to walk through it in like a slide format at this point, but we do have it in a document that we'll, we'll share around for you all to take a look at after this. So just wanna, wanna let you know that that's coming. All right, so I already mentioned team of three. Here you can see the other faces. Nicole Schmidt is our awesome uh, main project manager for our communications team, really talented graphic designer. Uh, my background is in key message development. I have a background in ocean science as well, and I tend to work almost exclusively on marine and coastal issues. So this is a really good fit for me. I'm a strategic communications person. I'm a facilitator. I work on legislative engagement. In particular, right now, I'm doing some of that for ocean acidification in Washington. So feeling really uh, excited to be bringing some of that here down to Oregon. And then Kayla Anderson uh, rounds out our team, super talented social media content developer in particular, and she is really curating some communities uh, around climate issues as well. So you have a, a good team here to, to bring you a communication strategy that looks good and sounds good too. 
So as we were thinking through uh, where we saw the main objectives for communications for the OOST in particular, three things really came to the surface. One, demonstrating the value of state investments that have been to date, foster relationships with legislative champions, both new uh, and existing, and elevate new research priorities for the upcoming biennium. Second, building understanding of why ocean science and research are important, specifically for Oregon, and all of this to enhance coordination on the regional message for West Coast ocean science while not losing the Oregon piece. And then third here is driving donations to support the OOST via the Oregon Community Foundation. So three core things. These are really laced through as we move into the target audiences to achieve these objectives. I'm gonna start by walking you through the three primary target audiences that we identified. The first of which legislators. So this is members of your legislature, particularly those that are engaged in committees relevant to the OOST priorities. Uh, some of the why and the thinking behind this, um, this one was pretty straightforward, I think, to be honest, considering what your funding model is. Uh, state funds, really powerful funding source for you uh, for distributing to ocean research partners. It will be really beneficial for you all moving forward to build relationships with house reps and senators beyond the existing OOST board members. Uh, and really ensure that ocean science priorities are considered for the upcoming biennium and moving into the future as well. And then also, I think just thinking about the current state focus on affordable housing and homelessness, uh, it will be really useful to have ocean science uh, have some really specific legislative champions to elevate these issues uh, for consideration in the governor's budget. So primary target audiences, particularly for the objective of uh, demonstrating the value of investments, that's legislators. Moving into that objective of building understanding. So primary target audience here, federal and congressional decision makers and agency funders. So it's those that can influence the focus of distribution of federal funds to the West Coast for ocean science and research. So again, some of the thinking there as other West Coast entities are working to communicate the importance of ocean science and research uh, on this side of the country, it'd be really important for Oregon to be a part of that big picture story too. And there's an opportunity here to really enhance the visibility of the need to understand and address the change in ocean conditions uh, in Oregon. Okay, and our third primary target audience, uh, this is really that objective driving donations. So here we have private funders, that's foundations, businesses, high net worth individuals. Uh, the work of the OOST is likely to really appeal to foundations, businesses, and high net worth individuals, uh, those that are looking to make charitable donations. And also raising this visibility can really lead to long-term uh, charitable investment. So I'll pause there. Those are our key objectives, our three primary audiences. As we were thinking through this, we also were thinking, well, there's that second layer there. So there are a few secondary audiences that I want to talk to you about as well. Research partners. So, so this is the current and future research partners that receive OOST funding uh, and that are engaged in advancing research priorities. Uh, agencies, academia, tribes. Other ocean-focused nonprofits, so specifically in Oregon and specifically those that align with uh, the OOS topic of focus and priorities, of course. And then the last one in here that I think I'm open to discussion more as well, uh, but the emotionally invested public. So as we're thinking about our third objective, that's driving donations, those private funders, those uh, ones that are going to make a larger sum of investment, uh, sometimes it can be easy to, to think of the public as maybe the small potatoes of that, but what we want to not lose sight of here is the opportunity of having the public engaged in what the OOST is doing, uh, those that are feeling driven to uh, donate themselves, even if it's a small donation, that can really add up, and in this case, we want to bring you the opportunity of not leaving money on the table. This can also be a powerful tool, and this is to Keith's point as well. People who are engaged at the on the public level, their constituents, the things that they care about kind of work their way up as well. Moving into how we're going to reach these audiences. So I have a few slides that are coming up here that have a, a number of activities. Um, so I'll talk through the activity, the approach. I'm not gonna really say anything about timing for the purpose of, of this discussion here, but that's there if you're curious. Uh, so some of the key activities that we see being really useful for reaching these audiences, we have developing key messages, but really specifically to about the uh, outcomes of the summit. So as you also work as a group too towards prioritizing what those um, topics are that you want to focus on moving forward, that will be something to be developing key messages around. Refreshing the website. So you guys already have a great starting point on your website. 
think what we can do and offer is to review the existing uh, content in there, work on incorporating those key messages, help to apply a really consistent voice, uh, particularly a consistent voice that really drives action and change towards what those objectives are that we have outlined for the communication strategy. Um, and again, just to kind of refine and clarify the mission and vision in a way that will resonate and be super easy for the general public to understand. Press release, also a great tool to use. So we can dist distribute a press release. Um, don't need to get into the media outlets right now, but the focus of this can be, you know, what is the OOST? Um, why is ocean science so important and particularly for Oregon? Uh, what are the big priorities looking forward? Where can someone go if they're interested in, in learning more? Some other things here, a priorities communications packet. If you think back to what our secondary audience was, but also higher in the tiers as well, uh, developing a high level communications packet that research partners can actually take and then use to share the key messages of how to talk about the work of the OOST, how to talk about the way that they are um, a part of your, your work. Uh, what are those priorities? And here's a formula for how to talk about the success of your work that's potentially funded through the OOST. Um, one thing I've used in the past that's successful is giving them a handful of slides. Like here, as you go out and you talk to others in this space, feel free to use these slides and, and use that as a way to elevate the visibility of the OOST. Uh, joining existing email newsletters as we're thinking about that building understanding, being really coordinated with other partners and organizations that are doing ocean science related work um, without adding to the noise by creating a new email newsletter. Instead, you know, there's already existing forums and uh, newsletters out there where people are already going to to find their information. Uh, that's useful to be coordinated uh, with. And if there are key messages or things that are um, important to highlight for the general public or that particular audience, that's something that we can we can build a list of and to get in those. Moving now a little bit more towards the legislative communication strategy. So two key things that are that are part of this, one being legislative work sessions, uh, presenting about the OOST and their priorities. And in this case, I have here flagged at least one legislative committee. If we can get more than that, awesome. One thing that I wanna be realistic about is just knowing how hard it is sometimes to get on those work session schedules. So that's something that we can be proactive about. And uh, if we can get one, that's great. Uh, I also have in here flagged uh, getting in front of the Coastal Caucus. And timing for this, this one is, really in, inflexible, I would say. Knowing the, the timing of session, this really needs to be something that's coming up towards fall of this coming year. So we have something flagged in here in gray as well, which is a legislative tour series. I have this one flagged as gray and pending available resources because we feel like it would be a really cool tool to use for legislative engagement, but right now it's feeling like a little outside of the available resources we have to give to it, but putting it on the table for discussion um, so this could be coordinating one to two events that are hosted by either an existing or a new legislative champion, but something that's really centered on a particular research priority or topic. Um, let me give you an example of what this has looked like before. So um, some work I was doing in Washington related to um, shellfish hatchery work. So it's an upcoming biennium year. And what we did was we organized a tour. We invited one of the senators to come. Uh, and they did, and they were available to talk about it, ask questions. We walked through this facility. And this was a great example of having something that's a little bit more tangible. If there's a particular research effort that has a facility on site, perhaps it's something that's in your priorities that are coming up. This can be a good way to elevate some of those and bring um, some positive attention. Moving into one of the last things that we have here on our, our tool. So social media campaign. Um, our proposition is for this to be something that's really grounded in establishing the OOST as a credible source of sharing information, um, specifically about ocean science in Oregon, of course, and also as a tool for encouraging donations to support the work. So I wanna make a case for social media. And what I wanna do actually is show you an example of what that can look like. Looks like we have Kayla on the line as well, which is great. So if you have any questions as we finish moving through this, we can talk through it some more. Let me stop my screen share. And instead I'm gonna pull up a couple of, um, links on my web page here and that's what I'd like to to use to show you. Okay. Screen share coming back. All right. So ocean 
conservation research. Many of you are probably familiar with this group. I want to use this as an example because they have generally similar types of topics, a similar model in the nonprofit. They accept donations, that kind of thing. So I want to start with their website just to kind of ground you a little bit. You'll see some similar things of donate, excuse me, uh, staying informed, so on and so forth. They have places where they share information about research that they've been doing. Oh, and I want to toggle my, my tabs, but I have my screen share bar in the way. So bear with me here while I figure out how to do this in a way. It just might be a little clunky. <laughs> All right, best efforts not coming to be. So I'm gonna have to do this in a slightly different way, just a smaller screen for you. Okay, sorry for the back and forth. So now you've seen their website, you kind of see what they're all about. I wanna show you how they use LinkedIn. LinkedIn, if many of you were professionals, many of us are on LinkedIn. Uh, those who are in the ocean research space, almost all are on LinkedIn as a way to share information, a way to engage with the partners that they're working with, showcase the work that they are producing. So I want to show you this as an example of just what it can look like in practice. Um, I'll also say that LinkedIn is often a place where people who are interested about a particular topic, whether that's professionally um, or personally, this is something that they do often see as a credible source of information. So the uh, OCR in this case has a series where they're sharing information about how sperm whales communicate. Uh, you'll see some of that show up throughout their feed here. Um, places to, to create community, talking about World, World Ocean Day. You'll see that many much of this is it's not cheesy. It's not um, something that's too flashy, right? But it is directly related to the work that they're doing and working to build people's interest and understanding of some of the things that they're doing like to flag here as well, some of the coordination with another partner as well. So that's uh, that's one other thing that's unique about LinkedIn is that many of the people that are research partners for OOST, uh, they're engaged here, they're sharing their work here. Just a nice way to, to be present. And then the next thing that I'd like to show you is how OCR uses Instagram, which I know can feel a little like, uh, maybe this is a little uh, a little too new, maybe outside of the realm of what the OOST could do. But again, if we think about not leaving the small potatoes on the table, uh, we're thinking here about building community, sharing information. I'll show you an example here. Again, you'll see some of the similar type of information that came up in their LinkedIn, recycling some of that content. So it's not like a whole new effort or a whole, um, it's not too much more of a lift essentially to do multiple platforms. You'll see engagement on things like this. And this next one, I think is a great example. Here they're talking about orcas and they have someone from their team talking a little bit about the importance of it and a call to action here about how making a small donation of just five dollars can make a difference and why so as we think about some of the sources potential sources of information um excuse me potential sources of funding for the oost having something like this can eventually be a significant source not from the get-go it takes some time to build things like a social platform um, but what it can do is to be a tool to help fill some gaps particularly as you're prioritizing having funding sources to maintain, you know, monitoring over long periods of time. If you lose a funding source, it's really helpful to have that kind of um, diversity in your sources as you know well. So that's my case for social media. Let's talk about it some more, but I thought I'd share that example. Gonna move back here to my, my slides and I just have one, one more. These are a couple of other ideas that came up for us. Again, grayed out because maybe there's something that's not feasible in the short term, but something that's worth exploring. Uh, so things like a website blog page, this is really a place where you can highlight those success stories, have something that you're updating maybe every few months, something like that. As you're actually having things come out of the research that you're funding, um, this is a great way to maintain relevance for the OOST. Um, on the back end of things, it really does help with um, search engine optimization, which is basically helping your website be something that pops up when someone Googles like ocean science in Oregon. This is going to come up there and that's a great way to have visibility for you. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Corey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we were going to say the same thing. Um, you're going to oh. need to reshare your screen because yeah. uh, the social media is still up. Oh, thank you for stopping me. <laughs> no worries. It says that I'm doing this here, but Again, having some issues with this one today. Coming back to you. 
Yeah, I know Zoom had an update uh, recently when I opened up the meeting today it was uh, re-updating the installer. So it could have been something like that. That could be it. Okay, confirming you see my final slide here today. Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Well, just to reiterate then, since you didn't have the benefit of seeing this on the on the screen at the time, so the website blog page is one example. That would be something that we we would add on to the website refresh. Um, and again, a great way to highlight success stories and really some of the outcomes of the work that's coming out of the Oost. And then another one, uh, this would be interviews with industry and coastal community members. This one's a little bit interesting, but I actually think it'd be a pretty uh, unique and powerful tool. So this would be a series of video interviews showcasing stories from Oregon community members who are actively observing changing ocean conditions. Um, maybe talking about what information they need to make decisions, why ocean health is important to them. Um, what this has looked like in the past for me as well as um, resource managers or people who are members of the uh, commercial fishing or recreational uh, shell fishing and crabbing industries, tribal members, um, state park reps, scientists, so on and so forth. And what it does is it really illustrates a wide range of interest in, um, in the coastal resources and in the coastal health. So this can be something that is appealing to uh, members of legislature as well, showing their constituents and some of the why and the emotion behind things. Uh, and what we try to do in a communication strategy is also think about the range of ways that people learn and take in information. So a, uh, a flashy, you know, one, two pager outlining your priorities, that's gonna be great for some audiences. Um, interacting with social media is gonna be great for others. Seeing a video as they click on your website that's highlighting someone from their community or someone who seems like, oh yeah, I'm interested to hear what they have to say. That's another way. So I'll stop there. What I've done so far is I've walked through the objectives who we're thinking of as the primary audiences, some secondary audiences there as well. And then the, the main activities that we think would be really uh, useful for reaching them. So I'll pause and really welcome any reactions, thoughts, or things you like, think you're like, I don't know. Let's talk about it. Well, uh, oh, I was going to break the silence and I see Ted uh, raised his hand. So Ted, please, after you. Well, this is, um, I'm very impressed with the comprehensive perspective that um, you're pre presenting to, to the Oost. And, you know, I'm very f fresh off the boat here. So uh, it, it looks, it looks great. And, and that last, uh, element that you talked about with uh, interviewing people in the community uh, about you know what's important to them, what they've seen changing, and and how the work that the Oost is supporting um, you know connects to that. I think is a is is a a strong idea. Um, one I don't know little thing you may, may have picked it up from earlier conversation when you talk. I think your very first element in the in the uh, uh, plan was to focus on a key message on the priorities that are coming out of the research summit, and we've it's going to be a little while before I think that we can identify what those messages are going to be, what our priorities are. So I wonder if instead it would make more sense to focus on recent successes uh, and sort of build on what we've already got in our pocket. Uh, and then we can point to the, you know, where we're going, and that's to utilize the information from the the, the summit as, uh, you know, guiding our our, our priority setting, um, but give us some breathing room to actually get there. Thanks for that, Ted. And yeah, I, I like where you're going with that. As soon as you all are ready and understanding that it takes time to do prioritization. Some of that messaging can be, uh, hey, we met, we, we brought all these great minds together. We're working on prioritizing now. This is an exciting time. We're going to have some new priorities coming too. So some key messages can really change and evolve along the way, depending on where we are in the phasing of things. So I saw, uh, looks like Keith, your hand's up. Thanks, Corey. Um, hey, it's one thing I'd like to mention, and it, it goes with the community outreach and those events as well. 
and something that we're doing with generational voices, we're working with 13 through 18 year old kids and, and matriculating into college, their college experience as well. Um, and we're doing town hall and podcast combinations. Mm -hmm. And we do that because, you know, we're able to then broadcast this out. We're able to host it. We're able to put it on YouTube, Spotify, you know, many, many platforms. And we, we found that getting the town hall attendance, uh, the town hall attendance came up significantly when we paired it with this live event um, because it was kind of a hybrid. It wasn't so much put, it took some pressure off people thinking that they were all going to have to be the, the main entertainment asking questions but we did both. And so we did the podcast, we had, you know, speakers, and then we invited, you know, the audience then to participate in the podcast. So I'll just put that out there as an idea to, to look at. And we'd be, you know, certainly interested in hear your thoughts on whether that might be an effective, uh, another effective part of the strategy. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I think it would be great to have some conversation around some of the, like, what would the focus of that be? What would kind of the outcome at the end of the day potentially look like? Um, so it seems like there's some some good fodder there to work with, though. So as you're thinking, too, I want to name one gap that we felt like we were uh, coming up to as we were working through this. And you might have noticed it in the activities. So one of the primary audiences was private funders. It's those that can offer the larger sums of money. Without some concerted effort towards fundraising, um, fundraising activities, that feels a little harder to pair or meet that objective with just communications. Uh, so I just want to name that gap. Um, I think that's something that will likely or could evolve along the way. But as it is right now, we're really prioritizing in our activities, reaching those, um, the legislative audience and building understanding, being coordinated with other partners who are doing um, ocean related work too. So just something to think about. Kristen. Thanks. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. You know, and I think the idea is Oost, we're gonna be hiring someone to help us do strategy for fundraising. Um, and so private foundations obviously big contributor. I'm also hopeful that also trying to tap into some big organ-based corporations. We have Nike, we have Columbia, we have Adidas, right? We have Anyway, there's, I think, again, that that uh, diversified funding stream and we'll have to have different messages for each of those, but that's still gonna be a ways down the road. Um, and then to Ted's point, I agree that I think we don't have the priorities for projects we're gonna fund yet, but I think we could start getting a, you know, nailing down our, our elevator speech of who is Oost? Mm -hmm. Who are we, what do we do? And just nailing that down um, and again, probably tailoring that to different audiences. Um, so yeah, just a couple of thoughts there. Awesome. Absolutely. So Laura, earlier you were gonna say something and then others had some things to chime in too. Was there anything on your mind? Oh boy, I just want to say, um, well done. I'm really excited to see this plan. I like the overall architecture of it. I think there's a lot of room for us to do some things right now and things to build into. You, the, For those of you on the audience who noted some of Corey's hesitation around the social media strategy, I think I was the one who maybe peppered that because I had been questioning whether or not social media is a credible source of information, whether or not the Oost is truly a public facing organization or whether we're more internal to key audiences and science community. But just even the brief um, example that you shared, Corey, leads me to believe that that is a very viable communications tool that we should be doing cautiously and judiciously. I'm always concerned that we would ever come across as being an advocacy organization which could compromise some of our niche in terms of just being a funder of science needs for, for the state. So I'm really excited to move forward with this and um, recognizing that gap does exist right now for the fundraising 
um, component. I I think that even though I, I understand where uh, Ted, where you're coming from in terms of us not getting ahead of ourselves with priorities, um, I kind of think that maybe if there are even one or two things that we think are kind of no brainers for what the ooze should be working towards um, or something that has at least been in our historical portfolio, it would be good to see some examples in advance of our next uh, big work session, which we just decided would be in mid to late March, so that we could see what kinds of, uh, what a tool would look like if a blue carbon ecosystem was considered a priority or a species abundance and distribution or whatever that is, um, that would at least give us something to, to kind of um, work with and towards. But yeah, otherwise I'm really excited to, to get this comms plan, to get it moving. I, I think it's a really good solid foundation for us. Thanks, Laura. Other thoughts or other reactions to the social media piece in particular? Just wanna just wanna vet that one with you all a little bit more. I mean, I could speak a little bit I'd to love... that. Oh, um, just to ease anything. So, currently, forty three percent of TikTok users say they regularly get news on the site. Um, and this is for TikTok, right? But, and we're looking at Instagram and LinkedIn, but even just with that information alone, um, a lot of people are turning to social media to get their news and information since it's most easily accessible. It's most, and most often not locked behind paywalls, like you find with a lot of newspaper sites and everything now. Um, and it's, with a cohesive message, you can build the credibility of yes, we are professional and we can have very specific CTAs that aren't led to advocacy. Like if we post about research that might feel a bit heavy, we can say, if you want to work on these problems, consider becoming a student in the field because we need more students getting involved in ocean science. Or there could be a CTA for donating to the organization to continue this type of research. Um, so there are definitely ways that we can have calls to action that aren't just... Um, that don't give off like, hey, go and sign this petition to talk to your legislator. And then that causes any uh, slew of problems, so. Thanks, Kayla. Let's do Karina and then Ted. Yeah, um, I like some of your ideas um, on the social media. So I kind of want to talk about the social media piece a little bit because I do feel like there are a couple of, like if you're invisible, it's also not so great, particularly if you're, um, audience even just for legislators uh, in the state like that is a it may not be so advantageous um so I think the two uh examples that you posted the LinkedIn and the uh, Instagram make sense I think they're manageable but there are sort of two trends for dealing with conversations on social media one is you know sort of more and the way you're describing it it it, it almost seems a little bit more like an outreach putting stuff out there there's also the conversational posture, right? Which is a little more, uh, requires a lot more investment uh, and knowledge. So uh, just wondered if you could speak a little bit to that, um, if you thought about that. I mean, I think you're thinking more about putting information out and referring people elsewhere. Um, is that is that true? Or referring them in? I mean, not to give money, but to like have a conversation, like who's gonna, man who's gonna manage this conversation? And Thanks for bringing that up, Karina. So you're asking too about the the managing a community piece that comes with social media. Kayla, do you want to speak to that some? Yeah. Um, so I, with organic social media, which means, you know, posting on social media without throwing money behind it or running paid advertising, the whole purpose of it is community building. And that is how we gain like fans of the brand. They are willing to have conversation. These are stakeholders that are interested and if and when we actually have a representative in DC to start sorting out and see what's going on there, if we can get representation, it's also a great communication channel for them to see what people are talking about since they are like chronically online. Um, and I think there's a balance between 
having a more conversational piece and then also having like the informational expression, especially since with what resources we have available in this RFP. Um, but I don't believe that is going to be a hindrance, like looking at building a platform from scratch. It's not like we're managing consistent community discussion 24 hours, Monday through Sunday, you know, type of thing. <laughs> it might be more a question for the board to think about, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to flag it as when you start putting content on social media, you start getting responses <laughs> sometimes. And, you know, sometimes they're, they're, they're lovely and sometimes they're benign and fun and sometimes they're challenging. Oh, I see. So the question is like uh, how to manage. How, how are we going to manage that? Are we out? So this is a board question. Like, are we outsourcing that to this communications team? Um, is that who's going to oversee it? Um, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I mean, managing yeah. social media communities is literally my job. Um, so if it falls on our team, totally got it. We would go and discuss outlines and guidelines of frequently asked questions. This is how we prefer to respond. Or in the case of trolls, this is how we respond and also give professional recommendations on how to manage those things. Um, definitely, I do think that is a board discussion. Um, as we go and start fleshing it out, we can come up with, here's things that we've seen or I've experienced in the past with previous clients. Here's what we can expect, recommendations from this end, and then what the board would prefer to be like the way we handle it moving forward. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't necessarily expect a full, full answer. I just wanted to start the conversation around that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Ted, go ahead. I mean, uh, somewhat related to that question um, from Karina is how do we build interest to uh, in the broader uh, out uh, uh, in the world of of social media users that we exist that our sites are there. I mean, we invest this money to develop the content and 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 the time to manage it. You know, uh, I I fully admit that I am a bit of a Luddite in social media, and I've done that deliberately um, to, um, but, but how, how would that grow? Let me, let me start this. And then Kayla, if you have things to add, I really welcome that. So I think it's important to remember too, that the social media campaign and presence is a part of a bigger picture strategy that's similar to the type of information that you're sharing in other places too, just a very different format for it. So social media and organic growth that's something that takes some time. Um, it's something that isn't really too much of a lift if you think about it in terms of you're creating content for one pagers, for a legislative brief, you're putting things on your website, you're asking partners to be thinking about success stories. A lot of that is a similar type of content that can be reframed and, and reformatted for a social media type of presence. So that's something that once you start putting the content out there, if you're being consistent with it, if you're uh, using really clear messaging, it's something that really organically grows over time. And it's really about just having your plan in place. Here's the content that you'd like to, to post over a period of time and then implementing and working that plan. So it's, I think to answer your question, Ted, it's really, it's quite organic in the way that it happens. Um, and that's something that we keep in mind in how we evaluate success for communications as well. So in social media campaign being part of that, we look at the metrics of who's, who's this reaching? Is it reaching enough people for this to be worth it? Um, what is, what is a reasonable timeline to be checking and measuring that success as well? Kayla, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, just on the organic timeline, it takes anywhere from six to 12 months to start seeing traction, but that is also six to 12 months of consistent publishing. So it's not like we go and publish two things this week and then we go and think everything and then post in February five times and we stop again it's we come up with a schedule and we say this is what we reasonably can publish and we maintain that type of consistency and this applies to all platforms linkedin or instagram um and so that's consistency in messaging consistency in aesthetic and consistency in how often you're present on social media and then after the mighty algorithm it's like ah yes you have paid your dues after anywhere between six to 12 months that's when you start seeing this exponential 
engagement and impressions and profile visits. Um, but it is a long game. But if you're not online in 20, we're in 2024 now. If you're not online in 2024, you don't exist, <laughs> um, which is one of those complicated conversations. But so all that to say, social media, it can be a really powerful tool. It's worth considering, worth thinking about. Um, I see the comment in the chat here as well for, um, excuse me, I don't know. I see the Jay Carter. I'm not sure if your name is, uh, first name is Jay or not, but uh, I want to just acknowledge there too, having seen it work successfully in, a, in another um, organization as well. So um, welcome other thoughts on social media, but also really welcome any reactions to other things, in particular, legislative engagement strategy. Um, how does that resonate? Let's defer to uh, our representative. Is is Gomberg still? Is David still on? Shoot. <laughs> oh no, I think he was until just a moment ago. So we right. just missed that. Yeah. Um, I think there's some really, from my perspective, there's some really good um, actions there as we learned from uh, one of the uh, presentations at the summit, the importance of the message, but also who's the messenger. And so making sure that we have good tools that we can arm good messengers with, whether that is us as board members or people that we pay to engage at that level or other members of the research community that we go in partnership with. But just having really clear, consistent messages, I think, is, is the start there. Um, I really like the idea of having some activities, you know, not just showing up and giving a presentation, which is important too, but having something that's more um, giving either legislative tours and asking our champions in the legislature to be leaders on those and we'll support them with tools for that. So I think that's, um, it's going to give us a lot of work to do in 2024 in preparation for um, going into next um, year where we'll probably have an opportunity to work towards a bigger ask. So one thing to be thinking about too, as um, there's a bit of a shift towards working to identify new legislative champions. I know currently you have some uh, legislative representatives on the board right now, thinking about how that carries into the future too. Thinking amongst yourselves as board members and then also thinking about your partners and who they might know. One of the most powerful tools is really having people who can pick up the phone and happen to know representatives, whether through that uh, personally or professionally. So just work in the network as much as possible and. ID any of those opportunities um, to be messengers once you have that list of priorities and we move towards um, budget request season. So something to think about. Keith and then Kristen. Yeah, Corey and everybody, I just want to uh, say yes, yes, yes. This is an important part. And, and I was really happy to see it really in that first box too, um, that this legislative um connection that we have. Peggy brought it up as well. And, and the, the thing is that two million is not enough money. It's not going to, we're not going to get there from there. And so, you know, we we should we definitely talk about that we are on a campaign to make sure that the machine that we're building, the RFP machine, the research machine, which is the center part of Oost, has the oil, has the oil to run it. If you run out of oil, you, your machine's not going to, you know, no matter how hard we work at doing our mission and, and making sure that we're funding, recognizing, promoting good research and science for the ocean. Um, if we don't have that, that, uh, that backup and that, that foundation of increasing funds and increasing exposure, especially at the legislative level, then, you know, we're, we're, we're going to put ourselves in a corner. So I think it's uh, central to our communications and um, I think, again, it helps us tie in that community part because the legislature wants to hear that we are bringing that community perspective in and then it, it melds, it matches with um, just those researchers. 
it, we, we, we quell that negative, uh, that, that negative perception that can, that can build if we don't do this work. Thanks. And so I, I mean, I think um, David Gomberg and Dick Anderson can help us also identify within the legislature <clears throat> other um, folks who would be good champions for us. Um, the core question for you, um, what about also identifying specific staffers? Uh, I, mean, I mean, staffers can hold a lot of power, you know, and they're the ones who can pull people. Anyway, so just maybe your thoughts on that or yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. So one potential strategy to think about too, especially as you start to move forward into prioritization conversations, um, this won't be appropriate for every space, but you might consider opening your your meeting um, for an appropriate slice of your agenda or one meeting in particular, sometimes having people, staffers in particular, legislative assistants for some of the reps that are maybe the chairs of the relevant committees, um, having them listening to some of that conversation and starting once you are starting to reach that point where you're coming to that prioritization or you're discussing some of the the whys behind why this is important that can be a really useful time to bring them in so lisa laura all of you that's a question for you to to consider if that's something you'd be comfortable with but that is something that can be a good good way to bring people in proactively and what do you think about also staffers for the governor's office and our uh U.S. congressional uh, staffers, if we're, if we're going to go for federal funds. Sorry. Sorry, I a little bit of a lag. I thought you were done there. I didn't mean to talk over you. Um, the last I heard there was you you mentioning the, the federal and congressional potential as well. So yeah. in reflecting on that, I think Gov's office, great idea, especially if there's a relevant um, policy advisor. Uh, federal congressional, I think would be more challenging. I have less experience really bringing in um, folks at that level, but certainly could be something to explore. Um, but Gov's office, I think, is a great idea. Yeah. Um, as we're wrapping up here, I would just want to point out one thing that you may notice if you go into the draft comms plan that was attached to this meeting announcement. There's a little bit of a mismatch with the primary and secondary audiences that Corey presented today. Um, I had the opportunity to review the comms plan a little bit earlier with Lisa and wanted to suggest that we move towards funders, potential funders, whether that is state, federal, or private, all as the three primary audiences and bumping public and other related entities into secondary. So just note that um, if you're reading that draft that was attached, we're in the process of getting feedback. I think it was really great that Corey and Kayla came here today to hear from all the board members. And I think they'll be updating that draft with all of our um, comments that we've been that we've been providing today. Thanks, Laura and Stephen, I see your hand. But just to say, I have an updated uh, version of the plan as well. I didn't realize that it was attached to this meeting invite. So apologies for not um, coordinating with Lisa to circulate that ahead of time. But why don't we do that after this? We can share with you all the updated version uh, that more closely reflects what we shared today. And then if anything else comes up for you, really welcome you to send thoughts to uh, Lisa or even directly to myself too. Stephen. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, at the federal level, Senator Merkley is very receptive at this point to ocean issues. For example, his, his hand has provided us here in Oregon with about $3 million uh, over the past three years for dealing with these kelp urchin issues uh, down on the South Coast. The majority of that being funneled through the Oregon, newly formed Oregon Kelp Alliance. Uh, but you know, don't don't um, ignore that, and that timing it, uh, is very good right now for as long as he's in office. And Steve, do you think is there a specific staffer that's best to be kind of reaching and working through to Berkeley, or the staffers have changed over the past three years, but we maintain pretty good working relationship with them. Uh, that's that's been you know that example that I just talked about. Berkeley has also been very important in terms of supporting or providing the impetus and momentum to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service 
to uh, put effort into the investigation of reestablishment of sea otters here at the federal level. And uh, anyways, um, so I, I just want to raise that point up. Um, the feds are, are very important. Great. Yeah. Make a note of that. Thank you. And I think um, as we just kind of wrap up here, um, that kind of brings to my to the forefront of my mind, Steve, a really important point, which is we need to be very mindful that we are not competing with the very people that we're trying to support when we go out to raise funds. And it's a very tricky space to be in. And one of the things I appreciate about the comms plan up front on the first slide is that there's space for us to help build the case for ocean research generally. And whether those funds flow to ORCA or Oregon Sea Grant or other entities that are working really hard on these federal relationships and state relationships, that's still a win for the state of Oregon and should be a win for us. We wanna be able to bring more to the table than what's out there, but that's part of our kind of threading the needle and getting to, I think what I heard earlier is really helping define what our niche is. And I think Karina um, brought that up. So adding value and not competing with the people that we're trying to support. So thank you. We've got, uh, we've got our work cut out for us. Uh, any final, questions or comments for the comms team before we go to our concluding part of the agenda. Exciting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank everyone. you very much. All right. I'm going to drop off now and leave you to the rest of it, but um, hope to see you again soon. Thanks for the time. And uh, I'll, Lisa, I'll follow up with you to distribute the updated plan. Great. Exciting. Uh, really good quality uh, people that we have working with us. I'm very excited about this. Um, so it's time for public comment. If any of the members of the public would like to provide comment, I generally just ask, go ahead and put your name in the chat and then I'll call on you in that order. So um, now would be the time to type in if you would like to give public comment in our meeting today. And while we're waiting for that, give that a moment to germinate while people figure out how to turn their um, computers back on. We're going to uh, have a few couple of things in member updates and other business. I just want to give a little bit of an update on just kind of, since you're all new, just give you a snapshot of what our financial picture looks like right now. And um, also um, give you a few updates on just some next steps that we're pursuing um, in regards to some of our partnerships and contracts. I'm not seeing anyone um, asking for public comment, so I'm going to take that as a pass. And um, all right, so member updates, other business. Um, I'm going to screen share very briefly um, a little budget summary that um, will kind of help give you a snapshot of where we are. Let's make sure I'm grabbing the right screen here. Uh, hopefully you're seeing uh, just a little Excel spreadsheet that says summary of financial position. Uh, is, that a, is that a yes? Uh, we have a treasury balance. So most of our funds are capped in the Oregon State Treasury. The balance right now is a little over 930000 We also maintain a fund at Oregon Community Foundation. That allows us to take tax-deductible charitable contributions, which is not 
an option for people that put funds into the treasury. That's been depleted post summit, um, which was by design. So some of our summit funders put money into OCF so that it's a charitable contribution and then OCF pays vendors on our behalf. We have a couple of pledges lined up for 2024 and 2025 commitments from Builders Initiative that have already been approved, but we won't actually get those funds until the midpoint of the year. So if you kind of look at it, look at this in a two and a half year timeline, we have total assets of about a million dollars, even though some of that hasn't been received yet. We have commitments out there already for nearshore grants, which was the House bill um, funds a little over 440,000 outstanding. We still have a little over 250,000 in ocean acidification and hypoxia grants that will cycle out this year in 2024 with final payments. We have some contract obligations for data inventory operations and comms. Some of those get us just into late this year. That comms contract is a commitment we have into mid-2026. So um, if you take those commitments out of what the expected income is right now, we're left with a net of about 260,000. A large portion of that is already um, line itemed for builders for an unfilled development director position that we are still working to fill. Some of it is for operations contract. We have very small overhead thanks to the support of Department of State Lands for administration. We just have some monthly banking fees and travel reimbursements and an annual fee. So I just wanted to give you all that quick snapshot. The Treasury maintains a really robust chart of accounts of all of these grants, and it gets very complicated and convoluted. So what I just showed you is kind of my own summary document. I think what it shows, and one thing that I think you all understand, but some people don't, is that the OOS doesn't have a pot of money of discretionary funds that people can come to and make a request of. We basically get funds for a purpose, and we move those funds out for that purpose. So um, most of the funds that we have are allocated out. Anything that needs clarification on that at this time? Okay. And I also wanted to take this time to um, just announce that uh, we're still working. We have not been successful in getting a candidate into the development director position. We are um, taking this in a stepwise fashion. One of the things that is a struggle is that the OOST is directing its efforts towards the legislature, which is a unique fundraising skill set. We have federal pots of money that we're looking for, which has its own kind of um, persons that do that work. And then the philanthropic part is a whole nother thing. So we're finding that a three for one is just not really coming to us, but suffice it to say that we have some more conversations pending and we should have something to report coming up um, when we meet again in March. And also we had a really great follow-up conversation with California Ocean Science Trust. And there's a lot of traction towards us moving forward, um, getting a, like an MOU at a minimum so that we have a, you know, something in writing that shows that we're working together and we're going to start um, having more active dialogue around how we can work together, particularly on the federal side, perhaps for areas where we have a lot of um, overlap in our priorities. And the last announcement that I have is that um, I, um, as the Ocean Science Trust, we have a seat that is on the Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Council, which was previously held 
by Dr. Christine Moffitt. Um, I get the pleasure of appointing that seat and uh, Dr. Keith Wolf is been gracious to accept that appointment to represent the Oost and to bring his experience and be that cross um, cross communicator between our entities. Also, Karina Nielsen also sits on that, but she sits for the C grant position that she holds. So we get we get a kind of double dip on that, which is nice. Um, Lisa, were there other business updates, announcements that you and I had discussed? And then I can open it up to the board at large for any other business or announcements. I don't think so. I think you covered it all. Okay, great. Would anybody else like to use this time for any other business or um, anything else that wasn't covered in the normal agenda? Yeah, Laura, um, just one quick thing. I, I'm new to being on a a, a public a board like this, and I wondered if there's a, some uh, sort of rules of the road for board members, you know, the do's and don'ts that, that uh, you know, if I was to get on the phone with Keith or Kristen, you know, uh, is that appropriate? What What is, uh, you know... We have to be careful for? about quorum. So... If you get on the phone with Keith, that's great. If you get on the phone with Kristen, that's great. If you get on the phone with both of them at the same time, now we've got an issue. So we have to be very careful about that. Even when we're in social situations, we're all at the summit together, you know, or we're all at an event together. Just be mindful of that because we're held to public meeting laws. And anytime three of us voting members are together, it could be construed as a public meeting. So um, that also extends to our email communication. I will never um, email all of us together with a conversation topic. If I need feedback, I'm gonna email individually. If I wanna reach everybody together, usually it's just an administrative thing that's getting sent out and it will go through Linda. So try to avoid any email threads. Um, if you're gonna to respond to something, just respond individually. Chris, you popped your camera on. Do you have something to add to that for us? No, Laura, that sounds great. And Michelle, I saw put something in the chat, which was also uh, great. Um, I I know early on we we um, we have I think we probably have some materials at DSL with regards to public meeting laws and quorums. As I was thinking about that, as you know, you have all these new members, so I can fish around for that. I think we've provided that in the past, but I know it's been a while. But I can I can look for that. Yeah, that's always a fun refresher, but I think we got to do it. So yeah, that would be very useful. It's always good to make sure that we're all on the same page, with, especially with a lot of new members. Thank you. All right. Great meeting, everyone. Uh, we'll get a doodle poll out for... Um, uh, meeting location and time and uh, that that'll be great it'll be fun to get it into a work session with you all um, that said I love closing a meeting even four minutes early it pleases me greatly so uh, thank you and um, yeah enjoy the rest of your day thanks everybody thanks everyone